Genjin Impact has a lot of character, and since its launch, many units have changed place numerous times, some having been misunderstood, others simply being less needed over time as new characters release. With that being said, we'll be ranking every unit in Genjin Impact, explaining their builds, synergies, value, and the downsides before placing them on a list. But first, let's explain the ranking system we have here. S tier, this is when a unit provides consistent value for any account they're used on or given to. This is a four to two units who are either extremely flexible and can work almost anywhere, offer insane value for low investment, or are inherently changing the difficulty of the game itself once you have them. A tier, this is when a unit is great, does the job well, but isn't game changing or requires significant investment to get going. Examples mean units who require extremely hard to reach energy recharge requirements or HP or an extremely difficult stat to get up. A tier, above average, a unit who's good, not great, and isn't exceptional in any way. C tier, you're average. You are the baseline for what a unit should be. D tier, this is a unit who really isn't that good. Not necessarily god awful, but more so you can invest into them if you love them, but other units can do their job better. And then F tier, you shouldn't use this unit. There is no worthwhile reason to invest into this character when every other unit or multiple other units can do their job much better, much easier, and for much lower cost. Now, this will be split into parts. This is part one. Part two will be uploaded at a later date. First and foremost, Amber. While she is a free character you do get at the start of the game, she doesn't necessarily hold much value beyond being an adequate torch lighter. Numerous times have her abilities been replicated by other characters, if not to better extents. Being a standard 4-star character also means her constellations are difficult to obtain, but in regards to constellations, none of them significantly increase her value. C2 seems like it would be wonderful to have, however you need to specifically hit the foot of the rabbit or barren bunny as opposed to just hitting the animal or Baron Bunny itself. This significantly reduces the opportunity of this constellation to be good because not many individuals are specifically targeting the foot of their summon. The movement speed bonus is equivalent to animal resonance. However, the downside of this is an attack buff of 15% whilst being decent can be given by other weapons, other characters, or just resonances themselves. This excludes the fact that characters and specific signature weapons also grant not only better attack buffs, but better movement speed buffs as well. Being a bow character, Amber is limited to a few combat sections. As Baron Bunny is not the inherent focus of her kit, her ultimate and charge shots will be. Baron Bunny has the opportunity to melt and or vape if you want it to. However, the downside is taunts in this game aren't as consistent as many individuals would like them to be. And so many enemies may either knock away Baron Bunny or just move out of its range and target you instead. Examples of said taunt include the Baron Bunny here. Whilst enemies would target Baron Bunny, some still remain targeting me, reducing the effectiveness of the actual Baron Bunny itself. As such, Amber gets an F ranking. You can invest into her if you like her, but there legitimately is no reason. Pyro is one of the more populated elements in the game, and many, if not all, units perform her job better than her. Not only as a damage healer, but as a support and elemental applicator. Next up is Kaya, known for his ice bridging. Similar to Amber as a standard banner character, the constellations aren't necessarily easy to get, this being one of the biggest limiting factors for a lot of these 4 stars abilities. C6 generating additional icicle means more hits and additional energy. C6 would be quite nice to have for any individual who chooses to main Kaya, but once again, similar to Amber, other units can perform his job, if not better. Save for ice bridging unless you have Ayaka or Farina. His C4 is a unique one, it gives him a shield. Whilst it has additional absorption for cryo damage specifically, it is still a nice bonus to have in the event that he is low on HP and does assist in solo runs. Not much, however. His C2 providing additional duration is once again a nice bonus. We rarely have additional duration increases save for units like Sino. The downside is Kai can be built as a physical or a cryo DPS. Whilst his ultimate deals cryo damage and is quite nice for passive application over time, not many individuals prefer it over the likes of AoE characters who subsequently can apply cryo not only better, but to more efficiency. Kaya's biggest issue if you want a cryo applicator outside of him is that Layla can do his job, Ganyu's ult can do this job, and so can numerous other characters, including Rosaria who transfers crit. And so from Kaya's perspective, you have to be much closer to an opponent to apply cryo to them if you want him to apply cryo for superconduct or for melt. And he's a standard unit. You aren't likely to get constellations on him and he's not likely to be a unit you carry on much further into the future. Not as bad as Amber, but not necessarily much better. We'll place him in C tier for now and we'll readjust later on. Lisa, for one of the more popular elements, she is one of the few characters who's gotten much better with the release of Dendro. Ignoring the constellation issue, though Lisa does have quite nice constellations, one of her unique abilities is to shred defense by 15%. Now, considering many individuals are free to play, you might not have access to C2 Nahida, C2 Raiden, C6 Yai Miko, and so on. And as a result, characters such as Lisa, who can benefit you by shredding defense, are rare and valuable. 
This provides Lisa with a place on Eula teams if you really want to maximize her damage, as you've seen with one-shot showcases. And this only further amplifies the fact by, and this is only further exemplified by the fact that Dendro has now given Electro a much more prominent place within the meta. Electro being great for Hyperbloom, Aggravate, Spread, alongside the old reactions such as Electro Charge, Superconduct, and now Overload, especially with the release of Chevreuse. If you're just going with Burst Spam Lisa, you do have access to a fair few weapons. If you're going for Elemental Mastery, you have a thousand floating dreams. If you want to prioritize your skill damage, you can go with Kagura's Verity from Yai Mika. Lost Prayer gives you Elemental Damage Bonus, and Catalyst have access to one of the best weapons in the game, the Widsith meaning she has numerous options to increase her damage. Her biggest limiting factor will always be the fact that she is a standard banner 4-star character, and as such many of you won't obtain these constellations such as C6, C4, and C2, which I do think make Lisa a phenomenal character. But as you can see here, I don't have them. As such, Lisa is a fine character, average. She provides something unique that not can provide, which is defense shred. However, over time, you will find that other Electro units, such as Fischl, such as Kaching, and Beto, do offer more damage than her with significantly easier requirements to meet. So, C tier alongside Kaya. Barbara, the unit who's most likely been in almost all of your polls, because she is significantly common on banners and somehow happens to have the highest drop rate. Barbara's constellations are unique in my opinion. C6 providing you with a revive can be useful in Abyss if you are willing to wait the 15 minutes that is required to revive a character. C4 increasing energy regeneration is quite nice. It does assist if you need to spam out her burst or if you're dealing with an enemy who particularly either has corrosion or some form of high damaging attacks. C1 in certain cases, if you're willing to wait out, can be used to passively regenerate her ultimate. This is useful if you're willing to sit on her as a unit in Abyss if she's your first character in your first party slot. That means she can be the character who actively starts the chamber. Not too useful, but once again it has a scenario in which you can use this character like that. Beyond this, Barbara has also found her role as the Thirteen Toes of Dragon Slayer holder, which is nice for the 48% attack bonus. And she also has her uses as a nice, or at least relatively decent, Bloom driver in certain teams. If you're using her with Nila Bloom, you also have the application of her not only applying Hydro, but subsequently healing your party, which alleviates the damage from Blooms himself. As a unit, you can also run something like a Dea build, which is Vorukasha's Glow. If you simply want to maximize her HP, you can follow the same train of thought of Nilo, which is Vorukasha's Tenacity for additional HP, 40% from the effects themselves. You can subsequently go with Maiden's Beloved on her if you truly want to, just to increase her healing effectiveness. For investment priority, her skill provides you with passive healing, which many of you will not be using. Instead, you're going to be prioritizing either her skill and her ultimate, or just her ultimate itself for emergency healing. Keep in mind the benefit of her skill is that over time, outside of the continuous regeneration, once you have her skill up and you auto attack, which mind you the auto attack damage does not matter, you would generate additional HP. This means that if you only need her healing over time with her skill, you can solely prioritize this. Her burst is just an emergency button you can press. As such, in the overall ranking, this lands Barbara, surprisingly speaking, in the D tier. While she is an average healer, healers over time have gotten so much better at not only providing more healing, but subsequently more buffs to her team. Her revive would be useful, but the once every 15 minutes effect does limit its value because many individuals won't be willing to wait 15 minutes for her revived again. And as such, this lands her in the D tier because healing as a category isn't as useful anymore, especially with forms of damage mitigation or elimination. And subsequently, her kit itself isn't anything exceptional and doesn't provide anything unique such as Lisa's defense shred. Razor. Razor is a unit who has not only good constellations, but a very good and synergistic kit. Outside of increasing his own energy regeneration rate, he subsequently has one of the unique abilities to, if you swap out of his elemental burst early, he regenerates the energy based on the amount that was left. As you can see here, he regenerates a maximum of 10 energy, which is returned to him once he leaves the field. This means that you are more incentivized and more capable of swapping off of Razor in the event that you need to, a trait that other characters desperately desire. Razor's biggest limiting issue is the fact that he is mainly a physical DPS. Whilst physical does have very good and decent sets you can use, physical as an element or as a reaction type and damage type is severely lacking. Characters like Eula can take a unique advantage of physical being either cryo or electro in Razor's case, and this does assist them in forming team compositions. The downside is physical does not have the absurd scaling of hyperbloom, vaporize, or melts, and as a result they fall behind regardless of circumstance. The only way to boost up physical's damage is either with the unique scaling and high scaling of characters such as Eula herself, or through extremely good weapons and artifacts, both of which can be slid onto other characters for better value. Razor himself only ascends with physical damage and does not ascend with crit, making him harder to build than other units, and whilst he has energy regen in his kit, and can work as a aggravate 
or boom, or specifically hyper bloom driver, it does not make him much better. Being physical not only limits his damage, but subsequently can work or ruin his pairing with certain characters like Bennett, especially if your Bennett is C6. In 1.0, he was an exceptional damage threat, especially as a four star, but nowadays, unfortunately, he is landing in D tier. Among the physical units, he is still C tier or even B tier, depending on how, how well you built him and how much you invested into him, but he requires high investment in the first place and physical as an elemental reaction and damage type follows behind. Shang Ling, one of the most well-known and well-regarded characters in Genshin Impact even since launch. Surprise Surprisingly, she does not have an alt outfit yet. Shang Ling is a remarkably easy character to build up if you want to. She has a variety of options from Staff of Scarlet Sands to Engulfing Lighting as 5 star variations or Staff of Homa if you truly want to, to the catch if you need it desperately. The catch providing you with 12% crit rate and 32% elemental burst damage, which is all she needs since she is only dealing elemental burst damage. The energy recharge helps alleviate her ER issues. Shang Ling's biggest downside is that she needs energy recharge. She is burst dependent and her burst has a high AD cost. This means that you will need to either funnel energy into her through additional power units or Favonia users or build ER in her kit. If you're not using an ER weapon, such as myself, you will need to use an energy recharge Sans or pair her with energy recharge characters like Raiden Shogun or Official to Battery. For sets, she wants Emblem Severed Fate, which many of you will have farmed if you were around during the Emblem days, which still never end. Primarily, she wants to prioritize energy recharge, attack percentage, or elemental mastery as her stat for her Sans, Pyro damage bonus as a goblet and crit rate or crit damage depending on the weapon you're using. Subs that you're looking for attack percent, crit rate, crit damage, and EM or EUR. For constellations, whilst all of them are just decent, specifically C4 has the most value with a 40% duration increase on Pyronado, which is her entire damage source because unless you're using her as a physical DPS, Pyronado is all she's there for. As such, the investment priority is solely focused on Pyronado, increasing her damage of the one unit in one ability she is using. Whilst you can level her to 90, which I do personally recommend for elemental mastery bonus and for the additional reaction damage increase, it is an expensive investment. Chainlink's synergies primarily lie with characters like Bennett. Bennett providing you with an attack bonus, at C6 providing you with additional pyro damage bonus, and allowing you to proc pyro resonance, which is 25% pyro, or 25% attack bonus for your entire party. She also works subsequently very well with characters like Lenny, who incentivize having Pyro applied to your opponents. She is great for vape teams if you want to vape your Hydro characters, and realistically, Shang Ling is a universal character who works pretty much anywhere. She is, to this day, one of the strongest Pyro characters in the game and exceptional as a launch 4-star character. As such, this qualifies Shang Ling as our first S-tier character, providing significant value as both a free unit and a highly invested unit for any account. Not only that, but she is also one of the hottest characters in the game. Her design is exceptional. Beto, one of the premier Electro units at launch. Depending on your standpoint, Beto is either one of the most significantly overrated units or underrated unit. It depends on how you use her. While she gets much better with constellations, specifically C2 and up to C6, all of her constellations hold decent value for this character. As a Claymore user, she does have pretty bad options. Verdict doesn't necessarily benefit her, but the crit rate and attack percentage is nice. But everything else from the Unforged to Gravestone are mediocre at best. They perform decent, but Serpent Spine is the best option. Serpent Spine requiring time to ramp up its damage. She also has energy recharge issues, making Skyward Pride a better option. Beta wants Emblem of Severed Fate, same as Shang Ling. With her caring about energy recharge, Electro damage bonus, crit rate and crit damage, and subsequently attack percentage if you can match the energy recharge requirements in her kit. Her investment priority is her burst, primarily. Her skill is solely used as a parry if you can hit it properly. If you can't, don't invest into it. This makes her a character who has medium investment priority in my opinion. What is her biggest downsides? First and foremost, Beto does not work with Raiden Shogun, a pairing many individuals truly wanted. Beto does however work with characters like Yoimiya. The biggest downside is, Yoimiya does work with other units such as Fischl. Fischl being a character who doesn't necessarily need as much energy recharge or any energy recharge because her entire kit is focused on her skill. Fischl is also a overall better character and more flexible unit than Beto. Beto being good and having high damage works out significantly well for units who can take advantage of that, but units who can take advantage of Beto can take advantage of pretty much any other character. And in most situations, Beto will do less damage than your Shang Ling, have more issues than your Fischl, and not be as valuable as a defensive unit as your Yelan or Xingqiu. 
While she is easy to build, Beto does not hold much value over other units. Her damage would put her into B and or A tier, but the flexibility of her kit and the issues and requirements for that kit put her into C tier, especially considering she isn't that good or the best in slot for many teams you would put her in. Xing Zhou, one of the most well-known characters in the game. Before being rendered as a Yelan character or a discount version of Yelan, even now, Xing Zhou holds significant value. His constellations are exceptional, C1, 2, 4, and 6 all being good. C6 reducing Hydro resistance holds significant value for Hydro-oriented teams such as him and Jalon or him and Farina as a unit who overall would appreciate any form of damage bonus. Many individuals seem to forget this, but Xingqiu also provides you with damage reduction, damage reduction being significantly valuable in teams or positions where you can be one-shot by certain enemies. The passive healing is nice as well. His application for Hydro is significantly higher than characters like Yelan, especially if Yelan does not have her C2, C2 increasing her Hydro application and damage. This means that at C0 comparatively, Xing Chou is better than Yelan for specific characters like Hu Tao. Who wants high Pyro and Hydro application? Xing Chou is an extremely unique weapon option, such as Wolf Fang, Haranga Pakufutsu, Mist Splitter, Skyward Blade, or what many of you may be running, Sacrificial Sword which not only gives him more damage and energy recharge from his skill bonuses and the additional skill proc, but subsequently allows him to focus entirely on the emblem set. Many individuals run energy recharge as a sand. You want to run attack percentage, hydro damage, and then crit rate or crit damage depending on what you need. Emblem of Severed Fate is however his best set. Xing Chou has and still is one of the best and strongest characters in the game for pretty much any team composition. This lands him right alongside Shang Ling in the S tier. Both of these characters being exceptional to use. Ning Wong, formerly one of the premier Geo characters, now forgotten by most. Ning Wong is host to some great constellations, some unique kits such as a barrier to block projectiles, but she is also suffering from one of the biggest issues in the game. She's Geo. Geo holds access to no elemental reactions beyond crystallized, crystallized scaling off elemental mastery, a stat that no Geo character to this day wants. She also entirely scales off attack percentage. Attack percentage is a stat that, while being common, is not given to you by the premier Geo support, that being Goro, who prioritizes defense and Geo damage. This means that while Ning Wong doesn't necessarily care much for being paired with other Geo characters, she subsequently also doesn't care much for being paired with anybody else, anybody else being significantly better value for her as a unit. This makes Ning Wong have great weapon options from the perspective of other Catalyst users, such as Kagura's Verity for her skill damage, Lost Prayer for her on-field time, Wood Sith, Skyward Atlas, or the Tome of the Eternal Flow, which increases her charge attack damage, which you may want to use given that she perks, given that she gives herself Jade, which require a charge attack to activate. She's also one of the few characters who doesn't specifically have a good artifact set. Looking at the combinations many individuals run, two beast gladiators for the attack percentage and archaic patcher for the geo damage. Two beast attack percentage with gladiators and shimanawas or archaic and shimanawas for the same thing, attack and geo. As such, Ning Wong is a character who has great constellations, but her specific weapon does not suit her at all. Artifact sets don't gear themselves towards her style of play, unless you use something like Wanderer's True for the charge attack damage bonus but lose out on the Geo damage bonus, and while she requires investment, her skill deals high damage, her burst deals high damage, and her normal attacks deal high damage, making her a character who requires high investment to get going. Unfortunately, with all that being said, this places Ning Wong at C tier. Whilst her damage can be considered B tier, especially for a Geo character, the investment requirement puts her solely into C and almost D tier. For now, we replace her at a high D tier, low C tier, because C tier will be higher populated than others. Fisho, one of the few characters who needs no introduction, from having an amazing outfit and design in both her outfits, and to being one of the highest valued characters in the game. Fisho as a unit is extremely good, offering you with exceptionally high damage, wonderful support for elemental reactions, great constellation, and good investment value. Fisher's ultimate just summons her skill, meaning you only need to invest into her skill unless you care a lot about the ultimate damage. As you can see here, it only happens with the Falling Thunder damage, not the Oz damage, which is what many of you will be going for. She has many great weapon. She has many great weapon options from Ali Hunter, Aqua Simulacra, Polar Star, the First Great Magic, or the Stringless, which is exceptional on her because all she's doing is elemental skill damage and elemental mastery assists in her reaction abilities. Reactions are one of the things she wants to prioritize most often because Oz does additional damage with electro-related elemental reactions such as Superconduct, Electro Charge, Aggravate, and Hyper Bloom. For sets, she now got a recent set with Golden Troop, increasing her damage significantly. However, as you can see here, you can subsequently go with multiple other options. Thundering Fury for additional electro damage and additional reaction damage, or two-piece Thundering Fury, two-piece gliders for the electro damage bonus and attack percentage. Fisher as a character wants to be met to level 90, specifically for the reaction damage increase. But even ignoring the immense amount of investment required to reach that point, 
and the wonderful design, which I will say is one of the best and hottest designs in the game, Fischl can still comfortably be, Fischl can still comfortably be placed at S tier, right alongside the other standard characters, making up the big three, Shang Ling, Xing Chou, and Fischl. Bennett, many of you know him, all of you should have been heard of him by now, all of you should have invested into him by now, he is one of, if not the best character in the game. But being rated as one of the worst characters in the game at launch, Bennett has stayed and remained a staple in almost any team. He provides you with an extreme attack buff of 112% or at max level 119%, extraordinary healing, extraordinary healing as a four star especially, great constellations with C1 being all you need to reach his max potential and C2, four and six only providing additional bonuses on top of that. Easy to build priority with either being no bless emblem for the additional ER if you want that, two piece, two pieces of both, and for main stats, HP is all you need alongside energy regen, because energy recharge rate is what he wants to significantly activate his burst and keep up the uptime permanently. You can build him as a healer, you can build him as a DPS, or just a general support for both. For weapons, he only cares about base attack. The subset is nice such as Skyward Blade, but realistically speaking, you don't need that. You can go for his highest options, that being Mist Splitter, Aqua, Akila Pavonia, the Alley Flash, or just a standard Skyward Blade like myself. Sapwood Blade being his best 4-star free-to-play alternative. Much does not need to be said about this character. He is, if not, the best character in the game, and he is necessary for a lot of characters to reach their peak potential, such as Shang Ling and him being paired almost always. Bennett is an S-tier character. Noel, once again suffering from the issue of Geo, despite being an extremely cute character with wonderful art and wonderful design, Noel's kit does not lend itself well to being a support. While she can heal and whilst her constellations are decent value and many of you likely have her at C6, she is not exceptional in many ways. Geo being a limiting factor, she has a unique ability to go off field once she is in her ultimate state and not lose that ultimate state, but she does not and is not a character who benefits much from anything else. She can work with pretty much any team and has one of the few idle animations or talent screens where she blushes, which I find adorable. Noelle is significantly benched by the fact that she is Geo. From the perspective of other Geo characters, Navia pretty much knocked her out of the water. Ito, in my opinion, is comparable to her, but Noelle offers more utility has healing, and it's easier for many of you to build and get. As such, from the perspective of investment, Noelle is a decent character with a lovely design, but her best set is Husk of Opulent Dreams. Many of you will not use Husk of Opulent Dreams. Ocean Hued Clam is a set that is good on certain characters such as Kokomi or Chi Chi if you really want to use it on them, but Husk is used on Ito, Noelle, Albedo, and that is it. Navia has an entirely different set that she wants to use, rendering this set more useless in those scenarios. Albedo can use Golden Troop, which has more resin value and is significantly easier to get pieces for. And if you want to use Ocean Hued Clam, you can also use Song of Days Pass for just a damage buff to the rest of your team, making Husk a very resin inefficient set to farm, specifically because many individuals will not use the characters who want to take advantage of this set. All that aside, Noelle is a C tier character. You can get good value out of her if you want to, and she obviously can hold more value than characters like Razor simply because she can also heal and provide you with a shield, but it does not make Noelle an exceptional unit. Zhang Yun, one of my favorite characters with one of the best designs, best idle animations, and extremely cute. Unfortunately, not that useful. Zhang Yun has decent cons. His C1 is unique. His C6 provides with additional damage. But beyond that, Zhang Yun is not that valuable. Cryo Infusion, surprisingly speaking, is not useful for the vast majority of characters. The characters who theoretically could take value out of Cryo Infusion have their own. Aika infuses herself with Cryo, does not need it. Shen He can take advantage of this, theoretically, but Shen He has a stacking mechanic that otherwise renders Zhang Yun's infusion useless unless you have C6. Yula is physical. Gan Yu is a bow character and does not need it. As such, this makes Zhang Yun's infusion not too valuable. It doesn't necessarily work with characters like Razor who are super conduct oriented. As such, Shang Yun holds less value for pretty much every character on the roster. Having a unique kit and unique design doesn't necessarily work when units can't take advantage of that. And whilst he is good if you want to build him as a main DPS and if you want to vape or melt or freeze, he works wonders. But even other cryo characters who can theoretically take advantage of stuff like Shatter have ways to do that on their own. Examples being Femine. Femine has cryo application in his kit and can shatter pretty effectively. If you were to invest into Chong Yun, you would ideally want full Noblesse sets, Noblesse and Vermilion, or Blizzard Strayer to increase your crit damage at rates. For weapon options, he has much the same. Akumaru looks wonderful on him. Verdict increases his damage. And much the same as he had the Claymore, he can go with whatever, Serpent Spine being his best. However, because of the aforementioned issues, Chang'un is a D-tier character. 
Not many individuals can take advantage of his supportive capabilities, and this makes him not necessarily worthwhile to invest into unless you intend on using him as your main DPS. Sucrose. Sucrose is, in my opinion, an extremely simple character. Whilst I don't like her design, she's very easy to look at and very easy to review. So let's talk. Constellations are all good. Additional charge increases her energy regen. Theoretically speaking, it gives her more particles, reducing her energy requirements. C2 increasing her duration, once again, is always nice, much like Sheng Ling. C4 reducing cooldown is nice if you can keep her burst up pretty frequently, pretty consistently. And C6 providing with a 20% elemental damage bonus is nice, similar to Kazuha. This makes her more comparable. She wants elemental mastery entirely as a swirl DPS, and she wants ER. Primarily speaking, you're not going to be leveling up her talents. Whilst they do deal additional damage, the main benefit will be swirling. Subsequently meaning you want to prioritize elemental mastery for this character. Sucrose is the premier standard bog standard. Sucrose is the standard four star swirl DPS. You want to throw out her ultimate, throw out her skill, swirl enemies, and swap off. Beardus and Venera is her best set and as such it makes her pretty easy to build, pretty comfortable to build, you just want EM max level. Sucrose is an A tier character. Other units deserve that S tier category. She offers you with some degree of control but not similar to Venti's. And whilst her swirl damage is good, she can in other ways be best met or matched by other characters later on. A tier. Jean. I actually prefer her formal outfit. Jean wants attack percentage, much like Bennett. She heals based on attack percentage, much like a new character, Xian Yun. But we'll get into her later on. Jean is a unit who has great constellations, specifically C4, providing you with a Nemo resistance shred, one of the few ways to get this before Faruzan, and C6 being at least a decent damage bonus at least a decent damage decrease. Jean is a unique character. While she is good as a healer and a Nemo support, she's not exceptional to any extent. As such, she's a good burst healer and provides you with significant damage on top of that. But given what we said previously, healing is not necessarily as prominent if you can ignore damage or dodge properly. So while being good, I can't recommend investing into her unless you legitimately love this character. Or you lose many 50-50s and have C4. You want Viridus and Venera? You want Viridus and Venera for her. You want Amino and Kageuchi, and she has access to great sword options similar to Bennett's. Energy Recharge and Skyward Blade, Akila Favonia fits her design and gives her attack percentage and healing. Overall, very simple to build, prioritize her elemental burst. Cheap to invest into in that category. This does place her in B tier, above average. While it's not necessarily providing anything exceptional, she is a unit who can work pretty much anywhere because of VV. She is not good without VV because her healing can be overtaken by other units who can provide more supportive capabilities. The benefit of VV is that shred, making her better because she's a Nemo and not a Nemo better because of her. D Luke, he's a pyro unit who theoretically has access to vape and so on but has fallen off long term. Shen Yun gave him a new burst of life with Dragon Strike, but now everybody can Dragon Strike, so it puts him significantly lower. He ruined a lot of 50-50s. So in terms of constellation value, he doesn't have that much. Whilst these constellations are unique and do offer more, especially with his C6 providing you with new normal attack strings, they're not too valuable. Compared to the rest of the Pyro roster, he falls behind, especially in terms of damage and ease of use. He's a Claymore character, doesn't have access to the same Catalyst or Spears that other units do have. He has hit lag that doesn't take good benefit of attack speed bonuses such as Mika or Yunjin. His passive is not beneficial in the slightest because nobody charged attacks with Claymore characters. He wants Crimson Witch of Flames, which sounds nice on the surface until you realize that other pirate characters have better sets. Shimanawa's or Crimson Witch for Hu Tao, Hu Tao's giving off HP. Shimanawa's for Yomiya. Diluc can't take full advantage of Shimanawa's set. Shimanawa's set being a set that's wonderfully easy to farm, especially if you're in the Emblem Domain, but Shimanawa subsequently only benefits your normal charge and plunging attack, the things that Yomiya and Hu Tao do exclusively but not necessarily benefiting his skill damage or his burst damage, which is what Giluk himself wants to do. While he has access to great elemental reactions, other characters do as well, and he wants to primarily be invested into his skill, his burst, and his normal attacks equally because he's doing all of them. This pushes Giluk to a D tier character, specifically because as a 5 star, he requires much more investment in terms of Mora and XP to get going. Chi Chi, bluntly speaking, one of the worst characters to have. If you're losing a 50-50, she is, compared to Dea at least, very bad. She's not the worst, depending on which one you prefer. Chichi provides you with healing and a revive at C6. I have C5. It is a pain. She wants attack percentage, making her marginally easier to build because she can take good advantage of those attack percentage pieces you keep getting with good substats. She can take advantage of Ocean Youth Clam, giving you more reason to farm for Husk for Noel if you intend on building her. She wants attack percentage swords, giving you good advantage of that summon shaper you got that one time you lost to 50-50. What is Chi Chi's biggest issue then? She generates no energy for herself or for other teammates, requires a high amount of energy for her burst, and does not have supportive capabilities unless you have constellations, specifically C4. 
C6 offering your entire party a revive is great in the attack is great in the event that your entire team gets one shot somehow. Maybe Corrosion. She does not remove debuffs on your team. She does not mitigate damage by removing it entirely, though she does heal an exceptionally high amount. She instead is just a good healer. But a good healer is not good enough in the current state of the game. As such, despite Chi Chi's cute design and despite the thighs, Chi Chi is placed at a D tier. Almost an F tier, but worthwhile if you want to invest into her for Farina. Mona, a character many of you want, some of you don't have. I prefer this outfit over her original one. Both are good though. Mona's actually quite good. Constellation wise, she holds decent value. And while she does to a degree compete with Farina because she provides you with a damage bonus much like Farina does with Farina being more accessible, Mona is still great for exploration, running across water specifically. She wants Noblesse or Emblem. I'm going with the Emblem build as you see here. Access to great options specifically because she turns energy regen into hydro damage, a feat not seen since Raiden. And whilst the omen and damage bonus it gives you is quite nice, it does have some glitch. It does have some glitchy effects sometimes, specifically because the omen is extended with freeze, and as a result, you can kind of work your way around it. She is also still used in almost every damage showcase, specifically nuke showcases. Because of her passive talent, which turns energy regen into hydro damage bonus, this incentivizes you to build hydro damage and energy regen on her, which is why people use emblem. And subsequently, this makes Mona exceptional as a supportive unit. She can take advantage of your emblem pieces if you don't need them, though she is now competing with the Elan for them. And she subsequently is a good support if you slap no bless onto her, providing you with an attack bonus and the damage bonus provided with her stellar phantasm. This makes Mona a pretty good character. I'd honestly say B tier, but compared to the rest of Hydra roster, she is C tier. This does put her, in my opinion, as a low B tier unit just for the damage bonus and the fact that she's remained relevant all this time. Kaching, she had new life breathed into her after the launch of Dendro. Before that, she was quite bad, considering other characters did her job but better. You either had physical or electric Kaching. Now you have aggravate Kaching. Does that make her much better? No. She's fun to play. Extremely fun to play. It has some unique playstyles, but she is now competing with other units. In aggravate, she's competing with the likes of Sino, a character who was built from the ground up for aggravate and quick bloom. If repairing her as a death, she's competing with every other Electro unit, particularly Raiden, who has easier access, better constellations, and better utility for your team. Does that make Kaching? No, Kaching is still a decent and fine character with a wonderful splash art and a better alt outfit. But it does mean that she's competing pretty heavily for positions you might otherwise fill. Thundering Fury being her best generalist set. Now, why is that? Because coming over to look at Thundering Fury, it gives you Electro Damage Bonus and a Damage Bonus for all of your Electro Oriented Reactions. Meaning that it's extremely beneficial for any Electro character to have in the event they can take advantage of it, which Kaching definitely can. As a Sword character, she has access to Mist Splitter, Summit Shaper, Kilovonia for physical builds, Haran Gidipaku Foods, Wolf Fang for the skill damage, or legitimately any other variety of weapon. Once again, Sword characters kind of win in that aspect. This places Kaching as a C tier character, as a fine DPS, but she had her flexibility and the fact that you can get constellations on her relatively easy does push her into B tier, specifically if you need an aggravate DPS or a bloom oriented DPS. Finally, Venti. Venti was the first five star character to launch with the game, so we'll be considering him in the beginning portions. Beyond that, we'll be slowly going through the rest of the roster until we catch up with the modern era of Xianyun and Gaming. Venti, in my opinion, still holds his value today. For being extremely cute, being mistaken as a girl, and having really good crowd control, he's exceptional. But why do people significantly underplay him? It's because of the likes of Kazuha. Kazuha is not Venti. So let's actually go over what makes Venti so good. Easy access to weapons like Stringless, or Alley Hunter, or whatever you want to pair him with. Elemental Mastery Scaling, or a Crit Scaling if you intend on building him as a Crit DPS. Beard and Venerate being an exceptional set regardless. Constellation wise, he does not need any. Whilst his constellations do improve his damage and the damage of other Enema characters, he does not need any of them. He only wants to be invested into his elemental burst. So he has low investment priority and low investment requirements. He refunds energy, 15 energy, to any element he swirls. So if he swirls pyro, all your pyro characters get elemental energy back. He's exceptional for characters who want to specifically get off their full burst, like Raiden, or characters like Eula. He still has the best crowd control in the game, because of how oppressive it is. Whilst it can't pick up large enemies, any small enemy, any abyssal chamber where you need to defend the monolith, he is exceptional in and being extremely easy to build. Whilst wanting to be level 90 for Swirl, if you don't care about that, you can just keep him at level 80. This makes Venti as a wonderful character. And as an Archon, if you're collecting Archons like Zhongli, Raiden, and Farina, you could get value out of him regardless. 
he's an exceptional character, competing in an entirely different niche than the likes of Kazuha, making him, in my opinion, a A tier unit. Enter into scenarios where you need crowd control, but A tier in pretty much every other scenario. Getting him isn't necessarily a bad thing, even if you don't use him that often, he's exceptional when he can be used. As such, I prioritize and recommend getting him. And this is the tier list so far, considering every unit in patch 1.1 or 1.0 when the game launched. We can rank a Nemo Traveler, but bluntly speaking, no one used a Nemo Traveler. His burst and his or her burst was pretty bad, considering it could just go off in a random direction and would not get caught on enemies, making him a worse variation of either of the two premier Nemo characters. Next up on the list is Klee. She was our first limited pyro, and bluntly speaking, she hasn't exactly held any value long term. Considering the rest of the pyro roster even at launch was good with Bennett and Shang Ling who can dish out either better supportive capabilities or better damage with less wind up, Klee was kind of in a bad spot. The downside of any of these earlier characters, I'd say specifically before units like Hu Tao, is that their limited weapons, quote unquote, weren't exactly good. Xiao had Primordial Jade Winged Spear, Amos both forgotten you, Albedo got Summit Shaper which didn't even work with him, Vortex Vanquisher for Zhongli was pretty bad, Tartalia had Skyward Harp which was technically speaking also Venti's signature weapon, and Klee had Lost Prayer. We didn't really start getting good signature weapons until after Hu Tao, if we include her as well. Klee essentially ran the same build as Hu Tao, Crimson Witch of Flames. She's one of the few characters to get additional skin, with her Witch skin which I think looked really nice. But what is Klee's biggest issue is that Yanfei actually does exist, and as a character Yanfei is arguably easier to play and has more defensive utility. In Yanfei's constellations, C4 gives her a shield, which doesn't sound like much until you realize that it stops her from being interrupted with her charged attack, something that Klee doesn't have. Klee's constellations are good, don't get me wrong, but if you don't necessarily use the character or the character at base value isn't that good, the constellations improving her doesn't mean much. Lost Prayer requires wind-up time, this means the character needs to be on field, and that's perfectly fine until you consider the fact that if you want to use something like a charge attack with Klee or Yanfei, you are not in turn procking rain swords from Xingqiu, making it harder to vape. Klee also had the issue in which her Jumpty Dumpty, i.e. her bombs, weren't capable of being picked up by Venti. So all in all, what is Klee's current ranking? She's C tier. Now while I like her design, in terms of damage compared to the rest of the pyro roster, she's much worse. Now she has gotten better, you can run mono pyro, but subsequently if we're looking at the introduction of newer characters after her, even though she does to a degree have decent scaling, the downside is Diluc also exists as a unit, and if we're looking at Shen Yun adding additional value, Diluc has Dragon Strike, which makes his multipliers better than Cleese as a catalyst. Diluc is also built more around the concept of being more movement oriented and fluid with his skill in the normal attack, skill in the normal attack playstyle. She is still adorable though. I do like her design. 10 out of 10. Diona is next and one of my favorite characters, extremely cute design, with great art as well. Diona hasn't changed much since launch. Sacrificial Bow or Favonius Bow is a great option for her, or you can go with something like Fading Twilight if you just have it lying around. I don't personally recommend it strictly because none of this damage bonus is really useful on a character who doesn't deal damage, but you can if you want to. She can theoretically run Elegy for the end, but I would recommend that on any other bow user strictly because, especially on characters like Venti, it's easier to proc the additional passive than her. She works wonderfully as a cryo battery, you can build her with full piece, four piece tenacity, a two piece of tenacity in Vorakasha's glow because her shield scales off of HP, whereas her healing scales better with healing bonus. You can go with either one. Personally, I go with tenacity. So far, I'm looking to either finish a four piece or get her Vorakasha's. It just depends on what I'm farming. She can go with healing bonus as a circlet, energy recharge or HP. I personally would rather go for HP as a sand and then energy recharge in the weapon and then HP in terms of the goblet. This strictly increases her healing and her shield, whereas with her circlet, go with healing bonus if you want more heals, and go with HP if you want a stronger shield. In terms of constellations, Ziona actually has eh, somewhat decent ones. Her C6 gives you elemental mastery to your party, which I think is wonderful, especially if you're melting. Her C4 is a charge attack increase, which nobody, nobody who plays Diona really cares for. She's meant to be a support. I don't understand why this constellation is here unless you're doing charge attack Diona, which you can do. C2 is a more co-op oriented constellation. The second half only applies to co-op, whereas the first half does increase its damage, but more importantly, the shield's absorption. Think of this as a mini version of Zhongli's shield bonus. And then C1 is just energy recharge. I actually like this constellation. Her best ones are C1, C2, and C6. C4 or C3. C3 increases her shield strength and C5 increases her healing or vice versa. 
Being a cheap character who's relatively easy to build and gives you additional bonuses is quite nice. Diona was subsequently paired on a banner with units like Xin Yan, who we'll be getting into next, and the premier shielder Zhongli. Zhongli also scaling with HP, but at the time of his release, scaling solely with attack or HP and on both at the same time, meant that he was a better shielder in pretty much every way, especially with the resistance to interruption and then the resistant shred that he universally gave everybody, but subsequently, as a 5 star he was harder to get. Diona being offered as a decent side grade to him at the time is really good, and I think this makes her as one of the better 4 stars to build into if you still need a shielder. Don't get me wrong, she has subsequently been battling for that shield position with units like Layla, who are technically speaking fighting for the exact same priority, Layla subsequently providing you with a shield and then additional cloud application that scales off her HP with her burst but Diona providing more supportive utility if you build into that. Diona also has the benefit of taking advantage of the Sacrificial Bow, which many of you, likely all of you, aren't using on anybody else. In my opinion, still a 10 out of 10 for character design. I like cat girls, and the whole cat motif in all of her abilities is quite nice. Overall, with that being said, Diona, in my opinion, is ranked as a firm B tier. Maybe not in terms of damage. In terms of damage, I would obviously place her down here in D or possibly even F tier, but for her supportive capabilities and the utility she provides you and the role consolidation of a shielder, healer, and cryo applicator, I'd say she's great to invest into if you need one. There are better options for each of those individual aspects, but she's great for the fact that she can do all in one. Tartalia. This is a unit who has remained relatively consistent since his launch. Now, at first he was misread and many individuals didn't understand how to use him. The benefit of Tartalia is he's not a constellation dependent. A lot of his constellations, if not all of them, don't really benefit him too much. To this date, he is the only character who has a passive talent that increases a talent level, with this being a normal attack talent level, which is how you see and can individually reach talent levels of 14, especially with release of Fontaine characters boosting their own normal attacks with their constellations. He has one of the most unique kits in the game that was severely misunderstood upon launch and he has gained great value. He works wonderfully if you want to run him in national team, which is Child, followed by Xing Chou, Xiang Ling, and Bennett. But now with that, he is fighting for that same position as Raiden Shogun or anyone else who wants to run national. So this does place him in a more tentative position. With the release of more Hydro characters, such as Ayato, Yelan, Nilu, Nuvlet, and Farina, he's fighting for a much tougher position along the Hydro element, which has severely power crept him in terms of the amount of damage they deal, but he still has one of the most unique kits in the game. Child is also among the many characters who've had multiple sets released for them. Heart of the Depths was originally released for him with the Blizzard Strayer set. It was actually a wonderful set and I still recommend it. We then had the brief Child Scare with Nymph's Dream, which bluntly speaking, nobody uses these days. But overall, you can run Heart of the Depths if you truly want to. He's had multiple signature weapons from Skyward Harp all the way up to Polar Star, which is his best weapon and the best weapon for official if you are official main or official lover. In terms of investment priority, his normal attacks, whilst increasing his Riptide burst damage and the individual damages of those Riptides they do, you would instead prioritize his skill and or his burst because it, as you see here, has its own multipliers, these being the dual blades. Unless you're doing charge shot or bow auto attack child, I don't personally recommend investing into his normal attacks. Though you can equally invest into all of them as they all do damage. So what would my ranking for child be? As a non-child main, I would rank him in C tier, but given the immense Hydra application he can provide you, and the fact that he works with most teams considering we have Dendro which uses Hydra, we have Pyro which has Vaporize, Freeze teams, and so on, I would rank him in B tier simply because of the amount of possibilities there are with a character like this. Hydra is a very flexible element. Next up, Jin Yan. I recently got my Jin to C6, or well C3. You don't need me to tell you that Jin Yan as a character isn't well loved or regarded by the community, but why is that? Well, Jin Yan is kind of dealing with a split scaling issue. I know we keep mentioning him, but let's go back to Zhongli. Zhongli scales with HP for his shield and attack for his burst. This was the biggest issue because he was originally marketed as a DPS with his burst scaling off attack, but now his entire skill orients itself around HP. People were unhappy with his damage, unhappy with his supportive utility, and the fact that, bluntly speaking, Diona was a better character than him at launch. Now he has dual scaling. What this means is that his attack still benefits the entirety of his kit, but his shield and burst as well as his normal attacks all scale with a small amount of HP. This means that you're not really losing much by building into either category. If you want maximum shields, you can build into HP for the sands, but you can go with attack. Dual scaling is quite nice. Shinyan has split scaling. This means that she wants defense for her shield and attack 
for her burst. Attack on her normal attacks. Why does this matter? Because her C6 is dependent on their defense to deal more damage. We don't really have defense scaling weapons aside from white blinds. And this means if you want to invest into her as a shielder, you can build more defense, unless you're going with charge attack damage. If you want to build into a DPS before C6, you'd have to go with attack, meaning her shield is virtually useless. Split scaling means you're having to prioritize two separate stats to get a character going. You can go with Bloodstained and Pale Flame for her sets, which I actually do personally recommend just because it's way easier than trying to get a full set. Gladiator's Finale works wonderfully at C6. Tenacity increases her ability to be a support, but does not increase her shield strength because her shield scales off of defense, not HP. Personally, I would recommend White Blind as a Claymore. You could subsequently go with Serpent Spine if you have it. If you don't, Wolf's Gravestone isn't that bad of an option and it does match her design scheme. If she generates a shield, and because she generates a shield, the Unforged isn't a bad alternative as well if you're still not using it. Eula's Song of Broken Pines is a and is the premier best physical damage claymore, but is still very comparable to a Serpent Spine or really any other claymore you have. Lithic Blade works better because she's a Leeway character and it gains her attack and crit rates, but you don't have any defense for her shield or her C6. Talent priorities I would recommend for a DPS burst and normal attack with a heavy focus on her normal attack. That is if she's going to be auto attacking. For a support, you can go with her shields and solely build her into defense if you choose to. But this should come as no surprise. In terms of overall ranking, Shinyan is an F tier character. She's a part of a very populated element and she isn't really worth investing into specifically for a shield because other characters do her job better. If we're talking about physical damage, you have Razor, Fremine, and Eula or many other characters such as Kaching, who could all occupy that physical slot better than her. Finally, the man himself, Zhongli. Zhongli is, as you can see here, my favorite character, so I have a lot to say on him. First and foremost, Zhongli has many weapon options, from Staff of Homa to Favonius Lance if you really want to improve your team's energy regeneration rate. The Thick Spear isn't that bad on him because he needs the attack anyway and the crit rate helps him deal more damage. Black Tasso if you want to maximize his HP for his shield and a little bit more burst damage. For sets, you have many options. Tenacity of Millith is the most common, but I can comfortably say that if you want to run Tenacity, keep in mind that his pillar still needs to connect with enemies to give you that attack bonus. I would recommend as a more comfortable option Tenacity and Vorokashas, specifically for the shield strength and the additional damage of his burst. You can subsequently also go with Noblesse, 4 piece or 2 piece. If you go with a 4 piece, you're benefiting your attack team, but at the same time, if another character like Bennett has Noblesse, it doesn't benefit anybody because it does not stack. 2-piece Noblesse and 2-piece Tenacity is good, 2-piece Noblesse and 2-piece Vorakashas is good, you can also go with 4-piece Emblem of Severed Fate if you have an extra set lying around. I personally would say that if you are going Emblem of Severed Fate and you do have extras of that set, here's what to look for. He can occupy and will occupy likely the same positions and the same set stats that Yelan wants, such as HP. A great example is a 20% HP piece for him, that is the equivalent to a 2-piece of Vorakashas or 2-piece of Tenacities. You want to maximize HP, you want to go for either crit rate, crit damage, or energy recharge depending on what you're going. Elemental Mastery is useless on any Geo character, attack percentage is quite nice. For the main stat, you can go with either attack percentage if you want to maximize his damage or HP for the shield. You can go with Geo damage bonus or HP or attack. Any one of them. I personally recommend Geo damage for his actual damage, HP for his shield strength and attack if you have nothing else. Then you can go with crit rate, crit damage or HP for the same rules following. HP for the shield and damage, crit rate and crit damage depending on which one you're going for. He has numerous different set options. If you're looking at constellations, C2 is his best one because it gives him a shield whenever he owes. C1 is just nice with the passive energy regeneration rate and there's possible chance that his second pillar may additionally proc tenacity. C4, better AoE, more petrification. Keep in mind that at talent level 10, he gets four seconds of petrification. This means six seconds. This means that the enemy will petrify for half of your entire cooldown. And considering he has a four cost burst, you can pretty much always keep petrification up. C5, additional damage and petrification time. C6, additional HP regeneration and some slight healing. This means that Zhongli will roll consolidate into not only resistance shredder, but subsequently your healer and your massive shielder. People say C6 is overkill. It kind of is, depending on the content you're facing off against, but we all remember the corroded beasts from Sumeru. So a C6 Zhongli might not be too bad. It does and is sometimes recommended that it ruins your synergy with characters like Hu Tao, but realistically, it's more beneficial to everybody else. So I don't say and cannot recommend that you skip it if you have the opportunity to get it because C6 is still good. And role consolidation is always valuable in my opinion. Resonant Waves allows his shield to take more damage. One of the passive things many individuals forget is the fact that his shield reduces resistances for all enemies, 20%. This is the equivalent to a Viridescent set. If we're looking into Viridescent pieces, this is a 40%. This is half of a Viridescent piece for every element. This means that the more elements are on your team, the more damage and benefit you're getting out of Zhongli's passive rather than trying to swirl one or every element individually. If you're looking into a damage loss that a shield may give you or that providing and using his ultimate may give you, find that six seconds of petrification or four seconds depending on the constellation level does mean you have better time to set up and can move away from enemies or heal if you absolutely need to. It does allow you some opportunity to breathe a 
especially in chambers where you don't have much of that. It doesn't petrify bosses, but neither does freeze. So keep that in mind. The flexibility and the inherent value of his kit and the fact that he's used for, used for basically every charge attack or bow character, he's an S tier unit. With constellations, he becomes extremely good. While it's not holding necessarily as much value as these characters, he is more flexible than pretty much all of them, save for Bennett. Finally, Albedo. He also subsequently has really long iframes for during his ultimate, meaning his ultimate animation takes an extremely long amount of time. The benefit of this is you can dodge big attacks and don't necessarily have to put up a shield if you don't want to. I recommend using the iframes of characters' ultimates to dodge attacks and or especially ones like Mayu Kenki or the spinning robots from Fontaine. It does not provide you with invincibility from corrosion though for some more reason for some weird reason. Albedo, as a Geo character, he kind of falls behind already simply because he is Geo and Geo is an inert element. He provides you with elemental mastery, but this isn't beneficial because most teams that want Albedo can use other characters, especially characters like Hu Tao's, Jaylon, and Xing Chou team. His solo isotoma can't be broken. This means that the entire point of his kit is basically worthless if his solo isotoma gets broken. He was released alongside Summon Shaper, a weapon that nobody wants, nobody needs, unless you want Chi Chi to have it and does not benefit him unless you're talking about his ultimate. He has a signature weapon, that being Cinnabar Spindle, but Cinnabar Spindle was an event exclusive weapon. I don't have it. So I'm slowly working on a fragment of Wolf Fang, unless I'm going with Chidori's weapon. Husk of Opulent Dreams is his best set, a set that not many of you will want to farm unless you want him to be best or Ito. He can also go with Golden Shrew, which I recommend because it's actually worthwhile. For consolation value, C1 is meh because you're not using his burst often. C2 makes his burst more wild to use. You can actually build into defense more because you don't need to worry about attack for his burst. C4 sounds good until you realize that Xiao has so much additional scaling that it's not really worth it and you can just use Xianyun now to get the exact same value if not more. And C6 is 17% more damage. It is not worth it. For a C6, it only gives 17% more damage. Mine has 666 for defense, look at that. Talent priority, only level up his skill. His burst is not that valuable. Please do not level up the burst if you aren't or not intending on getting C2. For the inflexibility of his kit and the lack of value it has, he is a C tier character. At Geo, the best value he has is giving you elemental mastery, but beyond that, he's not that good. Unfortunate to say, Fisher did it better. My lovely Gorgon Yu, new out outfit. Original outfit was pretty good too. Both are wonderful. Did you know that Ganyu's original weapon outside of Amos Bow was Aqua Simulacra, which was originally renamed to fit Yelan better? It still works wonderfully. I mean, look at it. It matches her alt outfit Bell too. Ganyu has two playstyles, Melt Ganyu and or Freeze Ganyu. Let's talk about Melt first because that's a more complicated one. Freeze is kind of simple. Get Blizzard Share, don't overcap on crit, and you're good. Melt Ganyu has many options. Her best option being Tignari's weapon, the weapon that's never coming back apparently. Amos Bow is a good option, so is Aqua Simulacra, but if you have refinements on Amos Bow, it can overtake it. Her best option, or one of her best, is the first Great Magic, but it's also Lenny's and doesn't necessarily fit her design scheme. If you don't have any of these 5 star variations, you can go with either the Battle Pass options, which are obviously still decent, don't match her scheme, but still decent nonetheless. We did get Evis Piercer, which was a free event exclusive weapon, I believe. If you missed that, you can subsequently go with craftable options, which will be shown on screen here. For artifacts, Wanderer's True is nice. You can go with Shimanawas, but please keep in mind that Shimanawas would require you to either A, be really good with charged attacks and really good at getting them out quickly enough without being interrupted, which I don't comfortably recommend. If you can do that, it is about a 5% increase from Wanderer's True, but keep in mind Wanderer's True gives you elemental mastery, which is actually really valuable, but it can be devalued by the fact that you can run Melt Ganyu with Nahida, who transfers more elemental mastery. That's beside the point. For main stats, you're looking for attack percentage, crit rate, crit damage, and elemental mastery. You can go with attack percentage or EM as a sans, depending on which one you need and which one has better substats. Cryo damage goblet, and then crit rate or crit damage helmet. Though keep in mind that Ganyu gives herself an additional 20% crit rates. You don't want to use her burst because in melt Ganyu comps, her burst would override the pyro application, preventing you from melting with your charge attacks. Her main priority is always going to be her normal attacks in melt Ganyu compositions. In freeze, you can go with her burst because you're providing a cryo application bonus and a cryo damage bonus to your entire party, but you can skip it because it doesn't necessarily deal that much damage. For constellations, all of them are actually pretty decent. C1 is great for reducing resistances. C2 holds more value and only holds value once you get to C6. C4, C3, and C5 all give you decent damage increases, but C4 being the best one as provided with a nice 25% damage increase. However, keep in mind this is burst reliant and many of you won't be using her burst. For Melt Ganyu, the same rules apply, though keep in mind Blizzard Share gives you so much crit, especially in addition to the 20% she already gives herself, it's very easy to overcap on crit. In those instances, I would recommend either an attack percentage weapon or a crit damage weapon. Many individuals say that Ganyu, Melt Ganyu, or 
Many individuals say that Mel Gagne is pretty bad. It's actually pretty good. The downside is Mel Gagne requires a lot of investment. She works wonderfully with the normal teams of Bennett and Shangling and or Bennett and Nahida. That's great. She also wants Zhang Li because she can be interrupted very easily. Mel Gagne is a pretty decent team, as is Freeze Gagne. I personally recommend Mel Gagne because it still works wonderfully against bosses. Just keep in mind, you won't really have much point in using Mel Gagne against smaller moths because they will die before that. As such, Ganyu overall, in my opinion, is a solid A tier character. She's maintained her value, she has two different compositions, and she's gotten more valuable with characters like Nahida now. If you want to use Freeze Ganyu, Freena works wonderfully with her too, adds an additional cryo application and damage bonus. Xiao, one of my favorite characters, despite the fact that he's being power crept slowly and surely, especially by the release of Xianyun. This is my Xiao, 82192. Primordial Jade Winged Spear, level 90, C1, Vermilion Hereafter, and Triple Crowned. She has not that complicated of a character. He wants a lot of attack. He has lots of multipliers within his burst. Please do not prioritize his burst. Prioritize his elemental skill last. Prioritize his normal attacks first, elemental skill second, and then burst last. His burst really doesn't give you that much damage increase. Instead, you would ideally want this to be level 10, and then everything else can be 6 or below if you truly want to min-max. It doesn't matter that much. I recommend his skill more. For constellations, is either C1 or C6. C1 just improves energy regeneration rate, but realistically, with the least of characters like Xianyun, Faruzan, and so on, you don't need it that much. For weapons, he has two options, Primordial Dragon with Spear or Staff of Homa. Both are good. He can go with Engulfing Lightning if you really want him to. I don't recommend it. Deathmatch, Lithic Spear, both work. Lithic Spear has gained more value with the release of characters like Xian Yun because Xian Yun is a Libre character as a Zhongli, as a Xiao. Beyond that, you really don't have many options aside from White Tasso, which is just for the crit rate. For artifacts, as you see here, Vermilion Hereafter is his best set, and realistically, the only set you want to use Gladiators and Two Piece Viri are realistically better just because you're going to have more Gladiators and you're going to have more Viridescent pieces because it's easier to farm and better to farm. Shimon always occupies the same slot as Gladiators simply because you're going to have that alongside Emblem if you choose to farm Emblem. Two Piece Glad, Two Piece Viri was his default set before Vermilion released. I recommend it over Vermilion simply because it's easier to get, more inclined to have, and more resin efficient. Now, for the ranking of Xiao, I would have placed him in B tier previously. He's not as flexible as Ganyu, so I will place him at the top of B tier, maybe low A tier as we continue on. Finishing off the last of the Liyue Big 3, Wu Tao. Extremely cute design, extremely nice thighs, enough said. Wu Tao. She wants HP and Elemental Mastery. This is my hotel build, 65206. She is not on a four piece Crimson Witch. You can go with four piece Crimson Witch, four piece Shimonawas, or two piece Glad, two piece Crimson. The benefit of Wanderer's True on a set like her is she's dealing charge attack damage, but she does not use a bow or a catalyst, so it doesn't benefit her at all. Only the Elemental Mastery, which is quite nice. If you are building your hotel, you want EM or HP, depending on the substats and depending on if you can get an element, and depending on if you can get an Elemental Mastery Sans. Pyro damage when it's Goblet, Crit Rate or Crit Damage, Circlet. For weapon options, Staff of Homa. Staff of Scarlet Sands is decent. I don't recommend it because it gives so much crit rate, but you can go with it. Lithic Spear, same as always. Deathmatch as well. Battle of, Battle of the Fjords, also a decent option. And Dragon Spain, if you have nothing else. Hu Tao doesn't care as much about base attack simply because she scales off HP and her HP gives us so much attack. C1 is her best constellation because it makes her so much easier to use. Similar to Xiao, prioritize that normal attack. Her skill is the damage conversion from HP into attack, and her burst is the healing and damage. As such priority would go, normal attack, skill, then burst. She's similar to Yoimiya, similar to Diluc, she synergizes extremely well with characters like Xingqiu and Yelan, with Xingqiu being better unless you pair them both together. Yelan does not have enough pyro application, Yelan does not have enough hydro application to keep up with Hu Tao. So unless you have C2, I recommend Xingqiu or pair them both together for the additional HP increase which increases their damage and C4 Yelan increases their damage even more. Wu Tao is a great character as such. She deserves an A tier ranking right alongside Ganyu. She's just gotten better with at least more characters who would even run her with Farina. Next up Rosaria, a character whose alt outfit I prefer over her original. Rosaria, a character I don't like, but let's talk about her. She can provide you with crit rate, so ideally you'd want to give her a crit rate weapon, either White Tassel, Deathmatch, Battle of the Fjords, or Staff of Scarlet Sands if you have it. The reason is, Rosaria transfers part of her crit, specifically 15%. So ideally, you would want to get her to a maximum of 100% crit rate if you can, just to give the rest of your party 15 crit. She's best used as a cryo applicator. All of her constellations are decent, but ideally her C6 is wonderful for physical teams, but she's kind of been replaced by characters like Mika in physical teams. So please keep that in mind. Additionally, to incentivize building crit, she gets more energy once she actually does a crit. And then C2 is additional duration increase, and C1 is just attack speed normal attack increase. I don't re personally recommend this because she's not going to be on field normal attacking that much, but hey, you can get it if you want. It's not that bad. 
For a set, no bless, specifically because even though Blizzard is nice, Blizzard Trayer doesn't give you that crit in your stats. It just gives you that crit once something is frozen or affected with cryo. This means it doesn't apply to Rosaria's crit cap. I would instead recommend no bless because all she's going to be doing is using her burst to give crit, apply cryo, and leave. Emblem just assists with her energy regen. For talent, it's going to be burst, skill, that's it. A very simple character, kind of works anywhere where you need a cryo battery or cryo applicator. Works wonderfully in physical teams, but for ranking, a C tier character. Flexible, useful, doesn't have as much utility as a Diona, or as much damage as a Shao and or a Tartalia, but still decent nonetheless. Yanfei, basically the exact same information as Klee. Charge attack focus, she deals normal attacks here and there, you can use stuff like Tome of the Eternal Flow, Lost Prayer, Kagura's Verity if you just want the crit damage, Skyward Atlas for the additional attack increase, Widsith if you want because the Elemental Mastery benefits any Pyro character, let's be honest here. Map Mare, Solar Pearl, or Ballad of Boundless Blue, which increases normal and charge attack damage, both of which is stuff she uses. Constellations, you can go with Wanderer's True, you can go with Crimson Witch, or two pieces of any specific set that benefits either attack, pyro damage, or elemental mastery. Same sad supply, attack, pyro damage, crit rate, and or crit damage. You want to look out for EM, crit rate, crit damage, energy recharge for her burst and or shield, or attack percentage. For Constellations, C1, C2 are all additionally damage increases. I don't recommend relying on C2's 20% crit rate bonus because while it is nice, it's still very situational. C4 is a shield, not that strong of a shield for DPS shade, but a strong shield for support Yanfei. And C6, an additional seal means additional damage because her elemental burst scales off the seal damage bonuses, as you see here. As such, with a very short ranking, she is a C tier character. Can be a B tier, I can see an argument for both who replace her as a high C tier because she is easier to play than someone like Klee. Eula, a physical character. Unfortunately, she falls into the trap that physical characters all do, that being no elemental reactions. Song of Broken Pines is her best weapon. You can go with something like a Skyward Pride if you need the ER, or Serpent Spine, which is a very close competitor, especially at R5, to Song of Broken Pines. Artifact sets, Pale Flame is her best set, or you can go with Two Piece, Pale Flame, Two Piece Bloodstained. Both work. Gladiators is the exact same. It does provide you with an attack bonus, but Pale Flame is still her best set. I can recommend farming this set because Tenacity is in the same domain as it, which is actually pretty good. For stats, attack percentage and crit damage. Energy recharge helps out too, alongside crit rate. Attack percentage for her sands. Physical damage bonus for her goblet. And crit rate or crit damage if you really want to go with crit fishing Eula, which essentially relies on you hitting the biggest number and critting in multiple chambers if you have the time and patience for it. I recommend only having her inside one if you intend on doing that. Constellations, all of them are pretty decent, but let's go over them individually. C1 gives her a C, uh, C1 gives her a 30% physical damage bonus. This is why you would ideally want to use her held skill right before her burst. Specifically to use those stacks, get a 30% physical damage bonus increase, and then her burst to pop. C2 makes you and incentivizes you to use her held variation because the cooldown is the exact same either way. I recommend using a held skill. In most of the time, her combinations will be a tap skill followed by her elemental burst and then finally collect stack and then use her held skill immediately before because her burst does reset her skill cooldown and her burst gains you one stack. C4, situational, not that good. C6, RNG on your constellations. Either she's dealing a lot of damage or slightly less of a lot of damage. Keep in mind, C6 is the only way you're going to reach the maximum of 50 stacks on her elemental burst. Of 30 stacks on her elemental burst. For pairings, Fischl is an extremely good companion, proccing superconduct and giving her energy. Raiden applies that exact same effect, alongside the additional elemental burst damage from her skill. Mika in that same vein is wonderful, especially at C6. He applies cryo, has a good battery capability, and provides you with crowd and entire team wide healing. But beyond that, her ranking is unfortunately going to be C tier. Whilst I have minus C6 and do enjoy playing her, and she is great for AoE nuke, she doesn't have the flexibility or the team composition of a Xiao and or Tartalia. She's not as flexible. She has a bit more of a playstyle requirement, and she is a bit more difficult to get value out of, especially because if the boss moves and your burst pops, you deal no damage. And finally, Kazuha. Kazuha gives elemental damage bonus to your entire party based on his elemental mastery. Freedom Swan is his best weapon. If you don't have it, you can go with alternative options. Xephos Moonline is good because it transfers the elemental mastery into elemental energy recharge for the rest of your team. It's quite good, but please get refinements on it before you use it. Favoni is sorted. It does pretty much the same thing, though it doesn't give you elemental mastery for him. You can go with Iron Sting if you truly want to. He has a Story Quest specific sword, which despite looking nuts in him, does not benefit him in the slightest unless you're talking about his damage, in which case Elemental Mastery is still better. Viridescent Venator, it's pretty much his only set. You want to stack as much Elemental Mastery as possible onto him. 
or constellations. C1 is good for additional energy regeneration, but you're going scale burst scale, which does take up on fuel time. C2 is great for transferring EM and makes him extremely good in Ganyu teams. But keep in mind, Ganyu is now competing for a Kazuha versus a Nahida who transfers elemental mastery anyway at C0. C4 is energy regen. It's nice if you want to glide. C6 is basically a confusion, but now Lynette does that at C0. You don't need to level up any of these. While these do increase his damage, they don't increase the damage of his swirls and or his skills burst elemental damage transferring. So as such, you can keep them level one if you really want to. My ranking for him would be A tier. Kazuo is not an S tier character to me strictly because while Farina does everything he wants to do but better, say for transferring elemental mastery and while Nahida transfers elemental mastery better than him, Kazuo isn't that flexible anymore. Whilst he works in many teams, many characters like Ganyu don't really care too much for the infusion or for the swirling. He doesn't swirl dendro, he doesn't swirl physical, he doesn't benefit animal characters or geo characters. And so that's three elements he's locked out of. He doesn't benefit his own element individually. Many characters nowadays don't really care too much because they have their own individualized support. From Kujo Sara to Faruzan and so on. Whilst he does his uses, he's not that big of a damage increase, especially if your character who you're trying to deal the damage with doesn't care too much about his damage to begin with. He benefits higher DPS characters in the situations where they already deal good damage. If they are not a hyper carry, he does not benefit them at all. And he relies and only can benefit one element, not multiple. Finally, entering into the Inazuman arc, we have Ayaka. I wasn't considering Kazuha in the Inazuman arc because he was released pre-Inazuma's launch. With that being said, Ayaka is a good character. I mean, she's fallen off a bit due to the amount of boss heavy content we've been doing, and especially with bosses that can't be frozen, so that is something to consider, but she is vaguely similar to Ganyu. First and foremost, Constellation value, C2 and C6 are her best ones. While C4 is decent at having a defense decrease, I would say C6 still provides you more value, and C2 is kind of a game changer if you can hit the enemy. With that being said, she is very evenly spread out in terms of the talent you want to invest in. Her burst being the vast majority of her damage, her skill hiding good damage, but not necessarily that much. And then even though her normal attacks can deal nice damage and her C6 is focused on charge attack damage, the downside is you want to be swapping over to refresh either your Kokomi's duration or apply more Hydra. So you won't be getting as much value out of this. She has gained more value with Farina. I could just want the Blizzard Strayer. She's an incredibly simple character to build Blizzard Strayer, and then you have multiple other weapon options. So let's get into that. Because of Blizzard Strayer's immense amount of crit and the fact that she can give herself crit, you kind of want to consider the weapon options. Crit rate weapons won't have as much value because it's very easy to overcap, especially if you get crit rate in your substats. Blizzard Strayer, and specifically Miss Splitter, is her best sword option. If you don't have Miss Splitter, you can go with a variety of different options, mostly scaling with either Attack, such as Aquila Pavonia, or Skyward Blade. Summit Shaper is surprisingly not that bad on her, but let's view the other ones. Amano Kokuchi is probably going to be her best option free to play wise, just because it gives you your energy back and that means that she can do her burst more often. So go with Amanoma. I honestly would recommend that. The other sword options are good, but either situational in the events you can't overcap with crit or aren't that much of an upgrade over something like Amanoma to the extent to where I would recommend sliding this onto your other supports. Go for Miss Splitter or use Amanoma. So in terms of overall ranking, I would say she's less flexible than Ganyu, even though she can deal more damage in the right situation in that the boss doesn't move or they're frozen, she is less flexible than her. And arguably she's less flexible than Hu Tao. So I would say that she's either at the bottom of A tier or high B tier. Sayu, one of my favorites, extremely cute. I like the little thigh. I like like Sayu, one of my favorites, extremely cute. I like the thigh straps, the fishnets, it's great. Let's talk about her. As a Claymore character, she actually has access to some halfway decent options. And considering she's a support in the same vein as a character like Diona, you don't necessarily need to worry about the damage she's dealing. Sayu is either an attack scaling character or an elemental mastery character, depending on the constellations. At C6, elemental mastery is a great option. That means she has three builds. You can go with attack percentage if you truly just want to prioritize her healing and a slight amount of her damage. Elemental Mastery if you want to prioritize the Swirl damage and a bit more healing, or a mix of both. Viridus and Venerer is her best set for Swirling, but if you want to just prioritize her healing capabilities, you can go full on attack with 2-piece Glad, 2-piece Vermilion, or 2-piece Shimanawas. Viridus and Venerer is the most common set, made in the Beloved if you have a bunch of them, which likely you do have if you've been farming Viridescence. For weapon options, Skyward Pride helps with the energy regen issues, and subsequently, the base attack on the weapon is nice enough to fix and work well with her healing. The other weapons are good. I'd say even Wolves Gravestone and Unforged are nice, but the energy recharge of Skyward Pride can't be understated enough. So instead, if you don't have any of those options, you can go with Sacrificial, Bavonius, or Rain Slasher for the Elemental Mastery. Ultimate Overlord's Mega Magic Greatsword is nice for the energy regen and the attack percentage, but I don't think many of you will have completed all the Melusine quest lines, so keep that in mind. 
For talent priorities, her burst is pretty much all you need to focus on. Her skill does have additional damage, but I don't recommend it because its primary use is swirling. And swirling provides you with passive healing, and her burst is solely used for the healing. Her best constellation are C1 and in my opinion, C6. C1 essentially is like Bennett. It removes the HP limitation for her little burst to deal damage and to heal. Whereas C2 and C4 are more or less energy regen or damage increases, which once again, aren't the main priority. C3 is also good too. As such, considering she's such a simple character, I rate her right next to Diona. They both provide utility and are pretty nice to have, even if you don't invest fully into them. Yoi Mia, I love this character. She's extremely fun to use and is much more flexible and simple to use than Hu Tao. But let's talk about her because she does have some caveats. First and foremost, build wise, it's either Shimano's Remnants or Echoes of an Offering. Echoes of an Offering, I would like to clarify, is not that bad, even though only 4% of people use it. Echoes of an Offering is ping dependent. If you have 100 ping or below, Echoes of an Offering isn't that bad. Echoes of an Offering only becomes worse at 200 ping or more. The reason is it's an RNG set. Now, why is this bad? Because you want to vape certain hits. But fact of the matter is below 100 ping or at 100 ping, Echoes is competitive with Shimonawas and it's just dependent on which one has better subsets. Many of you may have more Shimonawas pieces, but keep that in mind going forward. For main stats, you're looking for crit rate, crit damage, attack percentage, and elemental mastery. You can go with elemental mastery as a sand if you truly want to. I personally recommend it if it has better subsets or decent subsets because EM is usually better with vape reactions or any reactions. And if you've gotten Shavrus, you can kind of work with that too. Pyro damage bonus goblet and crit rate or crit damage circlet. Pretty simple to build. Thundering Pulse is her best option. It was made for her. It gives her a ton of stats. Keep in mind, if you are using Thundering Pulse, but remain below 100% energy. This is actually why I recommend Echoes over Shimonawas because it removes the energy recharge requirements. With Shimonawas, if you have Thundering Pulse, you want to be below 100% energy for Echoes for her bow to gain its full stacks, but you want to be above 15 energy for Shimonawas to take that energy away. So it's kind of iffy. Whilst the other bow options are decent nonetheless, her primary options would be Thundering Pulse, as I mentioned before, Rust, which is great, which is really good, but at R3 and below, Slingshot is actually competitive enough. Now, Slingshot does have the caveat that you kind of want her with Bennett, but it's still a great bow that provides you with crit rates. Constellations, C2 is good. I actually recommend if you have C2, you can go with an attack percentage goblet if you truly want to. Beyond that, her other cons aren't that good. C6 is kind of a downside because it does mess up her vape reactions. It'd be ideal if you have C6 to run her in mono pyro, which you can still vape, but just not effectively. And she obviously wants a shielder as a bow character. She's incredibly cute. I like the bandages. And as such, I would rank her as the exact same as Hu Tao. I'd actually rank her above Hu Tao. The reasoning is simple. She may not deal as much damage as Hu Tao, but she has the ability of ranged, which Hu Tao does not have. And even though she only hits one enemy, it's not that big of a downside when you consider the fact that you don't have to worry about stamina and can dodge more efficiently without having a constellation. Kujo Sar, I legitimately just got this character. So it's taken forever. I had a Raiden before I had Sar. I had a Raiden for a full year before I got this one. So let's discuss if she's worth it. Kujo Sara, she actually had a wonderful bow released in an event, Fading Twilight, which fits her design scheme and subsequently provides her with the stats she needs with high base attack as well. If you don't want to go for that, you can go with any five star variation because they're all good enough. The Stringless, while it's not benefiting her with Elemental Mastery, does benefit her damage if you want to prioritize that. Favonius, I actually don't recommend. I'd recommend Sacrificial above that, simply because Sacrificial has a higher base attack. If we don't have any of those, you can use Fav. I don't recommend any 3 stars because of the low base attack. And then the Severed Fate is her best option. You can go with Noblesse if you truly want to. The reason Noblesse is good is, once again, the attack percent increase for your entire party, but the downside of Noblesse is it only stacks once. Constellation wise, all her constellations are worthwhile to get, but C6 is the main one. Crit damage of 60% is nice for any character. Keep in mind though that even though this crit damage is nice, her ultimate, while stealing damage, only gives you the bonus of her skill, and her skill's bonus is only 6 seconds. Who is the character that can utilize that skill bonus effectively? Well, Raiden. This means that Kuchasara doesn't work super well with characters like Yai or Fischl who require a bunch of on-field time. Fischl can snapshot Yai's or can snapshot Sara's bonus. Yai cannot. So as such, only build up a Sara if she's C6 and you want an Nintendo using her with somebody such as Raiden Shogun. For stats, attack percentage or energy recharge if you need more of it, electro damage bonus goblet or crit rate and crit damage as a circle. Primary substats, crit rate, crit damage, attack percentage and energy recharge. She's very simple to build, but how would I rank her? Well, she is our first introduction to the category of elemental specific buffers. She's actually, in terms of damage, pretty good. And even though I said she only works with Raiden, she does at least work. So I'd say B tier. She's not as flexible as the Diona and Asayu, but she is still decent enough. So middle of B tier. The Raiden Shogun, my second most invested unit. Let's talk about her. 
First and foremost, she transfers elemental map. First and foremost, she transfers energy recharge into both attack percentage with engulfing lightning, but also electro damage. So obviously she wants Emblem. It's kind of the only set. You can go with Gilded Dreams if you want her to be a nice Hyper Bloom driver, but I don't recommend it if she's C2 and above. In terms of talent priority, just her burst. Her skill can be left at level 6 because that's when the additional bonus of Elemental Mastery or Elemental Burst Damage bonus kind of stops scaling. But if you like her a lot, you can go ahead and double crown her or get her as high as you want. Constellations, you all know C2 is good. C6 is meh. Constellations, you all know. C2 is good. C3 is nice. C1 is about a 15% damage increase, realistically speaking. But beyond that, none of these are too valuable. C4 holds more value if the rotation depends on other characters such as a Shang Ling or a Xing Zhou who can take advantage of the attack percentage. If you don't have Engulfing Lightning, you can go with the Catch, which I comfortably recommend any 5-star spear, and or the Battle Pass spears. Favonius is nice, but the downside of Favonius is it doesn't have the benefit of the Catch itself. So if you're deciding between a Favonius Lens and a Catch for your Shang Ling, keep in mind Shang Ling is proccing more reactions. So you can go with something like a Dragon Spain on Shang Ling if you have an extra. Raiden is primarily transferring energy recharge to your entire party and she's dealing damage. So you'd ideally want her to deal more damage with the catch because both of these characters, Raiden and Shang Ling, are dependent on the burst, but Raiden's burst has team utility, whereas Shang Ling is more reaction dependent. For her build, energy recharge as a sans, unless you're running the catch. If you're running the catch, you can go with attack percentage. Keep in mind that if you're running engulfing lightning, it's pure energy recharge for her kits. Attack percentage can be ran as a goblet if you're not running it in the sans department and it has better subsets, especially if you're using Kujo Sara. You can go with Electro Damage bonus though, too. Just keep in mind she's transferring that anyway. And crit rate or crit damage here. Keep in mind if you're using a C6 Kujusara, Kujusara gives you 60% crit damage. So you can build around that. Minus 78, 129. With Kujusara 60%, it's 78, 189. As such, overall ranking, I'd say she's also an S tier, strictly because she provides you with a lot of utility and can scale pretty well with constellations. Sangonomiya Kokomi. Now, Kokomi is a character who, build-wise, is very similar to a character like either Chi-Chi, depending on if you want Chi-Chi to deal some amounts of damage, or Barbara. You can either go full HP for Kokomi, you can go Vorkokasha's Glow alongside something like Tenacity of the Miller to maximize that HP. You can go with something like Song of Days Past, which is a new recent artifact set if you truly want to. I recommend something like the Ocean Hued Clam, which is her specific set, and it does allow her to deal with some additional damage. Now, don't get me wrong, it doesn't have the buffing capabilities of Song of Days Past, but this set is specific and very consistent. Kokomi, Chi Chi, and other overhealers can activate it, even in characters like Xian Yun, but we're getting into Xian Yun later on. If you are going for Kokomi specifically, and you are intending on putting her out with Ocean Hued Clam, you're going to want to prioritize HP, HP, and then healing bonus. Similar to every other healer like her, Kokomi's healing bonus will assist in her damaging capabilities, but you want high amounts of HP just in general. You can go with energy recharge if you truly want to, on screen will be sure to build right now. But outside of that, since she utilizes Catalyst, you do have a few options. Not many, but a few. Since her Jellyfish is essentially the main thing you're going to be using for your healing, unless you want her to be on field, Sacrificial Fragments is a halfway decent option. Prototype Amber is pretty comparable to her specific signature weapon, which is why everybody hates Everlasting Moon Glow. You can go with Prototype Amber, I comfortably recommend it, but if you do want to get maximum value out of your Kokomi and can specify your rotation to the extent to where the buff works well, then Thrilling Tears of Dragon Slayers is a good secondary option, or maybe even your best option if you can swap Pokemon onto your main field DPS or somebody else who needs attack. Keep in mind that weapons such as Favonius Codex or even the Widsith won't be as valuable on Kokomi because she cannot crit. And so as a result, if you're using Fav Codex, you're just using it for the ER. If you're using the Widsith, ignore the crit damage substat. If you want to boost her bloom damage and skill up her elemental mastery, you can go with a thousand floating dreams. But in that case, just go with Sacrifice as it provides her with a bit more value and utility. Once again, similar to a character like Barbara, you'd want to prioritize Kokomi's skill and then her burst, as those are the only things that scale with her healing. But her skill is the top priority simply because that is the passive healing you're using. Just keep in mind, it does force you to play around her jellyfish, but she is wonderful in freeze comps. With that being said, where would I place her? Well, upon her release, we ended up getting a situation under which we had the launch of Corrosion, which was an elemental or, or specifically a debuff that was only there to make Kokomi more valuable. Kokomi was released before we had Ocean Hue Clam and before we had Corrosion. After Corrosion, Kokomi's value shot up. You could say she was really good, but she wasn't the only hero, and she didn't have the same capabilities of a character like Jean in that you had Viridescent Venerer. 
So Kokomi's value at the time was pretty decent after the launch of Corrosion because she was your best healer. And she's gotten better. With the release of characters like Nilo and Nahida, she works wonderfully in Bloom-oriented teams. However, as Freeze has gone down in its value, and as Bloom has had better, if not more versatile, Hydra applicators, Kokomi's value has kind of dropped to the extent to where I'd say she's a good character, but in terms of the healing roster, she's not the best anymore. And she is competing with better healers with better buffing capabilities. So I would say just a B tier. If you're looking for utility and role consolidation, Diana provides you with a shield. If you're looking for somebody else as a five-star gene, provides you with Viridus and Venera Shred. I am aware Kokomi has Song of Days Past, Kokomi has Ocean Hue Clam, but it doesn't make her better than either of the other options. Next up, Toma. This is going to be a very, very quick ranking. Toma is a character whose constellations can be good, yes, and I do think that as you get more of them, he holds more value for your account, but to be honest, Burgeon isn't that valuable of a reaction even now to the extent to where you'd ideally want to use him. I don't think many people will be investing into the Toma. If you want a shielder, you have better options. I am aware he works wonderfully as a good budget shielder, but one of the problems I think a lot of people may face is, yes, he is a shielder, and yes, he is decent, but once again, in the shielding meta, you have Zhongli now, you have Layla, you have characters like Diona, who can essentially do the exact same job. And if you're using him with somebody like Yuemiya, who may work wonderfully with him, you have the option and potential of him applying Pyro and overriding the Pyro you applied with Yuemiya, overriding the Hydra application that you were intending on vaping on. So it's a bit of an issue. With that being said, aside from that and ignoring that, Toma subsequently does have a bit more of a complicated shield. And I think people kind of like shielders to be plug and play. You plug them, you use their skill to generate their shield and you leave them. That's what Noel has, that's what every other shielder has. And Toma has a stacking mechanic around his shield, which it's a bit iffy. With that being said, his damage isn't necessarily the best, especially if you build him out to be a DPS, because once again, he has split skill and you either build attack for his damage or HP for his shield. For weapon options and build options, if you want to go full shielder, you're essentially just going with Vorukasha's Glow and Tenacity solely for the HP as you with. If you want to go with Burgeon, Yielded Dreams for Elemental Mastery, or you can mix and match two piece, two pieces. Now, since he is Burst Dependent, Emblem of Severed Fate will be a good option. You can go with something like a Favonius Spear or Lance. You can go with any other energy recharge. Even if you want to do the catch, you can legitimately go for that option. Noblesse Oblige is great for just buffing capabilities if you can manage his energy recharge requirements. HP benefits his shield, ER benefits his burst. Both both are important, please maximize the value. I don't recommend going for any form of pyro damage on his goblet, just go with HP for better shields. HP once again here, or if you're using Favonius Lance, go with crit rate. EM only affects his burgeon damage. Talent wise, you're going with his skill and burst, you can ignore his normal attacks. Once again, very short and simple, where would I place Toma? Well, to be honest, I don't believe Toma's gotten any more valuable since the launch of his character. I understand, you know, Dendro came out and it kinda gave him a little bit of a spot, but being blunt here, D tier. He's competing in a shield based meta and every other shielder in the game that's either been ranked or has yet to be ranked is better than him. As a result, I don't recommend investing in him. I understand he's a good character for some people, but he's not valuable enough for the vast majority of people. I'm not gonna lie, I was excited for Gore. He has a cute design, iced for him. And I still do think he's lovely and adorable. However, in terms of actual value, that's where things fall off. Gore is a character who buffs Geo units, and even if you if you don't have all the Geo units in the game, he is not going to hold that much value. Goro gets more value the more Geo characters you have, the more Geo characters who specifically skill up defense. That is going to be him, Noel, Albedo, and Ito, as well as Yunjin. But Yunjin is a niche and very specific case scenario, so I won't go into her right now. So why is that? Goro wants either Favonius or Slingshot. You can go with whatever I recommend Favonius. It's just best for anyone. You want Husk of Opulent Dreams or Husk and Emblem or Full Piece Emblem or Noblesse Oblige. All of these work. Defense or ER, depending on which one you need. Defense for set because he's not doing as much or any really worthwhile form of damage. So you want defense to improve his buffing capabilities. And then crit rate or defense percent, depending on what you need. So why is it that Goro isn't that good? Well, his entire buff revolves around his skill, which buffs defense and geo damage. The deal, the geo damage bonus is perfectly fine. The defense, however, is where it falls off because not all geo characters want defense. Zhongli wants HP and attack. Ningguang wants attack. Navia wants attack. And so he's buffing a very small selection of the geo roster, which is already a small selection of characters. Now, beyond that, 
At C0, Goro is not that good of a buffer. At C4, he performs his job as a little bit of a buffer and a healer. And at C6, he actually buffs Geo wonderfully. But that is C6 of a 4-star who is only featured on Geo defense-specific characters, that being Ito. So all in all, Goro is not that good of a character anymore because Geo is still a very uncentered element. You either have the HP and attack people, the attack people, or the defense individuals. And so where does this place Goro as a unit? Unfortunately, he's our worst ranking elemental specific buffer because he doesn't even buff his full element. At least Sara can buff her entire element. Regardless of how long it may last, Goro doesn't buff his whole element properly. Arasaki Ito. And to be honest, he's a character I hate. So I'm probably going to speed run through this. Ito is an individual unit who I think once again, like Goro, had some potential and really good value early on, especially as a Geo character, but that's fallen off, especially with the launch of Navia, a character who is much more flexible as a Geo unit. Ito is burst dependent. Think of him as the Geo variation of a character like Raiden, Sino, and so on. Ito wants to be paired with other Geo members. First off, they generate Geo particles, which allow him to hit his 70 cost burst. Second off, once again, if you're pairing him with anybody, you're going to pair him with Goro. Goro allows him to maximize his buff because Goro is going to be only paired with other Geo units. So ideally, your composition would be Ito, Goro, followed by Albedo and Zhongli to maximize the effectiveness. And Goro at C4 would become your healer, but you really don't need one if you have Zhongli. Since Zhongli is one of the few ways to get resistant shred for Geo, he works out wonderfully for that team. And since Albedo is providing additional off-field damage, he helps everybody. It's a win-win. However, Ito gets really good value with constellations. So why is he a negative character in my eyes? Well, it's the inflexibility of his kit. Unlike any other character on the roster, Ito doesn't work well with other elements. Lenny, even though he wants only other pyro characters, has one slot that's very flexible. That being a Zhongli if you want that in, a Kazuha, doesn't matter. Lenny just wants other pyros, and pyro has very flexible units. You either have him, you can add in a Roos for healing if you really need to, you can add in a Toma, a Yanfei, Xian Yan, legitimately anyone else. Pyro also has access to Bennett and Shang Ling, some of the most useful units in the game. Geo doesn't have that, and so Ito's inflexibility with other elements makes him a much more difficult character to build around and work with, because you kind of need the rest of the Geo roster to get max value out of him. And when you're comparing him to his most recently released counterpart, Navia is much more flexible and provides you with decent damage in a shorter window. Now, this isn't all to say that he's a bad character, but if we're comparing the weapon options they have, Navia's Claymore is more flexible because it provides you with crit rate and attack and has decent base attack. These three things make it more valuable on the rest of the Claymore roster in comparison to Redhorn. Now, Redhorn does provide you with a high crit damage substat, but the defense isn't that useful and many Claymore characters won't be normal attacking unless they're Eula. But Serpent Spine once again works well on anybody. If you're going with and going against Serpent Spine and getting his weapon, you can go with White Blind, which is your only other option. Now, for Ito, you're going to be building him like Albedo. Husk of Opulent Dreams is your best set. What are you looking for? You're looking for, well, specifically crit rate and or crit damage, geo damage, and then subsequently defense. That's it. That's all. Now, Ito is also technically speaking a much more high investment required character because as you see here, similar to other units like Xiao, Ito's burst just provides him with additional scaling. It does not inherently have its own scaling. This means you're going to be leveling up his normal attacks first for the stats they give you at base value. His skill, Ushi, is actually pretty high damaging, so you want to invest into that. And then it's burst for the bonuses of the attack and the speed. So you're going to be equally investing in his normal and burst, followed by his skill last. So all in all, where does this land him? Well, unfortunately, previously, before the launch of Navia, he would have been maybe B tier. Even if he's inflexible, he's comparable to Xiao. But as a result, Xiao has more accessible supports. So low B tier, maybe even C tier because of how unflexible Geo is at the moment. Shiori may help that, but as of right now, Ito is arguably the worst mono elemental character because he has the worst elemental support, Gora. Yoon Jin, she's going to be a pretty short character to review as well. First and foremost, Yoon Jin suffers from the issue of she only buffs realistically one or maybe two characters, that being Wanderer and a Yormiya. Those are pretty much it. Nobody else cares enough about normal attacks to make it worthwhile. This lowers her ranking to begin with. She's constellation dependent. Mind you, if you're buffing a Yormiya or anyone else, she's competing with Bennett, the character likely all of you have built, all of you use, and so it's kind of a tough comparison. She also doesn't heal, unlike Bennett. So why is that? Well, 
Yunjin buffs your attack speed and your normal attack damage. First off, not many characters want to normal attack in the first place, but secondarily, attack speed is beneficial only to a certain subset of characters. If we're looking at Yoimiya, she cares about it. Why? Because she's a bow character. Same thing with Wanderer, but if you're looking at other characters like Yula, they don't care because Playmore characters and any other melee character have hit lag. And so, attack speed isn't super beneficial. It's why the closest character who benefits from attack speed is Razor. And what does Razor give himself? That's right, speed. Normal attack speed bonus. So as such, Yunjin is fighting for a very undervalued position. And prior to C6, Yunjin is not an upgrade to Bennett. But let's talk about her. You want to give her energy recharge. This could be either the catch itself, this could be Favonius Lance, or an ER weapon like Engulfing Lightning. That's that's legitimately it. Husk of Opulent Dreams, or two-piece husk alongside two-piece emblem or emblem or noblesse to buff your entire party. I personally run Husk, why? Because the defense she has is related to the amount of buffing she's giving you, as in a 55% bonus to defense and it goes up every time you level it up. Since she only has a very small sub selection of synergies, it's kind of iffy as to if you should invest into her, I personally don't recommend it too often, because she also has higher burst requirements at 60 but doesn't generate that much energy unless you're doing her counter properly. With that being said, if she's C6, she's wonderful for a character like Yoimiya and allows her to get one extra rotation in. Great. But unfortunately, this lands her right alongside Goro, not because she's inflexible, but because nobody wants her buff to begin with, unless they're Yoimiya and or Wanderer who also have options to other supports. Shenhe, look, I'm just going to be blunt about this. Shenhe is not a very good flexible character. I don't want it to come off as bad, but let's talk. Shenhe is essentially like Xianyun. She wants a high base attack weapon, except she's dealing with the spear roster. Spears have a lot of good options, but none of them are her weapon. Calamity Quella gives the highest base attack in the game with an attack percent subset, essentially the exact carbon copy of Crane's Echoing Call, except without the specific plunge attack bonus of a specific passive, I suppose you would say this is. You want to give her attack percent of Shimanawa's and Gladiators for her, or Shimanawa's and Emblem if you really need that burst. That burst runs off ticks, which is why Ganyu is not a good character to pair with her, because Ganyu technically uses up two ticks anytime she has a charge shot. One tick to fire the arrow, another tick when it pops with the Frost Flake. So as such, she only benefits Ayaka, but not even Ayaka's full burst, only part of the burst, so it's kind of iffy. But beyond that, Shunhe wants her burst and her skill, as both give her quills. Whereas the burst itself lowers resistances, the skill is your quill, so ideally you're going to be going from skill into burst. Her constellations help you with that by giving you an extra stack or an extra charge. Now, crowd crit damage seems good because every character gives himself crit, but realistically it's only benefiting Ayaka, so please keep that in mind because other crowd characters don't need it as much because unless your shot is C6, you really don't care too much about her. Shinher, despite having good design and actually being featured in pretty good story quests, is not a very flexible character. So as such, this lands her and in the D tier. I would put her in C tier because of how much of a buff she can be to Ayaka, but bluntly speaking, she's a 5 star character and that is her biggest issue right now. She's a 5 star who isn't that good or universally applicable. Every day we inch closer to Inazuma, out of the Inazuma arc into the Sumeru arc, and then Fontaine. We are almost out of the trenches here. Yai Miko, a character I've invested heavily into. This is my Yai Miko subset, 77 to 37 with no energy recharge and electro goblets. But let's talk. Her best weapon would be Kagura's Verity. Her second best weapon will be a thousand floating dreams from Nahida. She recently got access to the Golden True set, which is her best set as of right now. Or Gilded Dreams, but I personally recommend Golden True simply because it's more universal and more consistent. Gilded Dreams can be better in the event that you are using her in a dendro oriented team. Wow, these stats are taking a long time to load, so let's ignore that. You're going for attack percentage. Elemental Mastery sounds good on paper, and realistically, it is good only in dendro and reaction dependent teams. Otherwise, go with attack percentage. I recommend attack percentage strictly because it's more consistent. Electro Damage Goblet and Crit Rate or Crit Damage depending on what you need. In terms of talent investment, Yaimiko is pretty simple. You just want to level up her skill. Her burst is a decent priority, don't get me wrong, but in a lot of rotations, you won't be focusing on it. You're going to be going skill, 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 and then swapping out to another character. If you are using her burst or are intent on getting more damage out of her, her C1 essentially reduces her 90 cost burst down to about 60 cost. Her C2 is about a 25% damage increase and expands her range, which I think is the best quality of life constellation for her. C4 only holds value if you're running her with somebody like either Fischl or maybe Raiden. The problem with Raiden is she gives herself so much electro damage bonus it kind of falls off, which is why you can run attack percentage on Raiden. And C6 is just Raiden C2. I would honestly say if you're going to invest into Yai Miko, you could go for a C2 Yai and then follow that up with a C2 Nahida because you're both increasing her damage via aggravate and spread and so on. But the defense decrease of 30% is quite nice as well. And it's way cheaper than going for a C6. But if you do intend on going for C6, C3, 
4, and 5 are all useful. So what would I place Yaimiko at on a tier list? Well, previously, I would have placed her down at the C tier, but as of right now, I would actually place her into B or even a high A tier. I will place her into A tier for now, strictly because Aggravate is such a good reaction as is Hyper Bloom, and she's so great because she benefits from EM. Kamasato Ayato. Uh, being blunt here, Kamasato Ayato is one of the more difficult Hydro characters to talk about, not because he's complicated or anything like that, but more so because Hydro as an element is so saturated with good characters, from Shincho to Mona, and everyone else, Ayato is kind of the most boring of the bunch because he's technically speaking competing with Totalia, but Totalia is more complicated and arguably more fun for some individuals. Ayato has a very standing playstyle. With that being said, Ayato's ideal set theoretically is Echoes of an Offering, and yes you can go for that, but you can go with Heart of the Depths and a lot of other alternatives that will be shown on screen here. His prioritizing of normal attack does not matter. Ayato has a separate ceiling in his skill similar to other characters, so you only want to level up his skill and then his burst. Outside of that, his normal attack can be left at level 1. Whilst his Namisen stacks do deal additional damage based on HP, it is not worth building out HP on Ito. Instead, you can prioritize HP once you have constellations like C2. But beyond that or before that, you don't need to. As a sword character, Ayato falls under multiple options for weapons. If you need energy recharge, Skyward Blade is always a perfectly fine option. Mist Splitter, Hiranga Paku Futsu are both wonderful as well. Wolf Fang is actually quite good because his skill has its own damage numbers, it's not a normal attack. Essentially, if you build a Xing Chou, you can build an Ayato. Though, don't go for Akilo Favonia simply because he's not dealing physical damage at all. Since he fits into the exact same mold as a character like Totalia, you can run somebody like a Bennett, someone like a Kazuo if you're going to be swirling Pyro to Vape, you can run a Shang Ling if you truly want to, you can run a Beto, you have multiple options. So where would I place Ayato? Honestly, he's getting slid right next to Child. They're basically the exact same character, one's just more easy to use and one's more complicated but can be more fun and deal a little bit more damage. It's just interchangeable with those two. Next up, Yale, a character many of you know. First and foremost, we're going to just immediately go to the tier list and because Yale is a pretty well-known character, we're sliding her to the bottom of S tier. I will not and want to clarify this. Yale is not better than Shincho. This is my Yale. She is at 92, 219, she's running Aqua Simulacra, she has EM of Severed Fate, which is her best set unless you can go with something like Heart of the Depth, but realistically I just recommend Emblem. She is C4, and she has 3, 8, 12 for talent. Yelan at C0 is not better than Xing Chou. In a lot of scenarios, Yelan isn't still better than Xing Chou, strictly because Xing Chou, despite having a pretty simplistic hit, and despite having Hydro Resistance down in a lot of his constellations, is benefiting from the fact that damage reduction is in his kits. Yelan doesn't have any defensive utility. Yes, you can run around with her. Yes, she is great for mobility. But beyond that, if you get hit, you get hit. That's it. She can be a tank because of her high HP, as you can see here, minus 30k. Beyond that though, Yelan kind of falls to the situation where she's a side grade in a lot of scenarios, and unless you have C2, she's not a direct upgrade. At C2, she becomes comparable to Xingxiao in the sense that she can actively keep up with pyro applicators like Hu Tao. Before that, she's works, and which is why Yelan works wonderfully with Yoimiya because her arrows track, but not wonderfully with Hu Tao by herself. Her constellations are all good, C1 quality of life and more additional running speed, C2 just additional hydro application, C3 is good because her dice and specifically her skill does deal a lot of damage, so both of these cons are actually wonderful. C4 only benefits Yelan, Nuvlet, or essentially the Fontaine roster with Yelan, Nuvlet, Farina, herself, uh, Hu Tao, and Zhongli. It doesn't benefit many other characters, so I'd say this is kind of like a 3 out of 5 for cons because it benefits certain teams but not others, and then C6 is wonderful. It finds, a little, it finds a lot of damage, but it can be iffy if you want to vape around it because you're only getting those additional few shots. But beyond what I just said, what about building out your line? Emblem of Severed Fate is her best option is universal. You want HP or energy recharge, hydro damage bonus, and then crit rate. If you're going for an HP substat or HP main stat, you only want one of these. You don't want triple or double HP. Hydro damage is usually going to be your best option, but HP can be better if it has better subsets. Just keep in mind your energy recharge rate, whether you're going on energy recharge stance or an HP stance, depends entirely on what weapon you're using. Beyond that though, you want HP as a subset. Previously before this one, I was running, I believe, this one with 20% HP, but I obviously upgraded. Now if you're going for weapon options, Aqua Semi Locker is her best option simply because Yelan does not care about base attack. The crit damage is nice, the HP is nice, and the direct damage bonus is nice. If you're not going for that and you just want to focus on strict damaging options, you can go with something like the Stringless, Alley Hunter, and so on. And I'm saying and so on because Jalon basically only has two options. You can go with Aqua, Stringless, or Favonius Warbow. 
If you're not going for this and don't have that, you can go with Sacrificial, but the energy recharge is lower and it does rely on you doing her scale twice, but this can simulate a C1 for you if you truly wanted to. Beyond that, her normal attacks only benefit her breakthrough barb damage. Her C2 is her skill damage, which is quite high, especially if you vape it, but C, her talent for her burst is essentially your top priority. Her burst is the main majority of her damage, then I'd say skill, and then I'd say you can leave normal attacks at 1 unless you're prioritizing that for maybe her C6. As such, she's still high on her tier list, but not at all level. Hugi Shinobu, we're finally entering into the Sumeru arc, but this is technically before that. Because Kuki Shinobu was a bad character on launch. I do believe she's gotten much better over time, don't get me wrong, I wish to show her build on screen here. But the constellations are pretty decent. Her C2 essentially gives her 100% uptime. C4, I don't think many characters really care too much about. Yes, it's electro damage, and yes, it is based on her HP, but you aren't building her out for damage, and it doesn't matter that much. C6 allows her to essentially survive one shot attacks. This means that you can swap her out if you're about to die immediately and just want her to take the hit as opposed to somebody else. It does not affect corrosion. Please keep that in mind. While her burst is damage and based on her max HP, you only want to want to prioritize her skill. You can prioritize her burst if you really want to, but her skill is her healing. Her skill is essentially her entire purpose for being on your team because the EM from this and the healing bonus allows her not only to keep your team alive, but to additionally help with Hyper Bloom reactions. She is competing in a Hyper Bloom slot with characters like either the Raiden Shogun or units that we already have leveled like Fischl. She is still a great character to use if you want to. If you're looking for weapons, you can prioritize either Elemental Mastery or HP. If you're going for HP, the Dark Hands Assistant is giving you HP. You also have Key of Caution Suit, which is her overall best in slot, as it not only benefits her healing, but the Elemental Mastery. If you aren't going with that and want to build full EM, z Moonlight benefits your entire team with giving them energy recharge. Freedom Sworn benefits your entire team with giving them a damage bonus. Sapwood Blade benefits her with energy recharge, but a slight EM bonus, I honestly don't recommend it. Fab is if you really want to help out your team with energy particles, or Iron Sting, which is her universal best option for free to plays alongside Tobaku Shigure. Gilded Dreams is her best. Gilded Dreams is her best artifact set, but if Flower is a Parrot of Lies or Fable is still decent. However, I don't recommend firing it strictly because even though it does boost your damage, nobody else really cares too much about the animal set it's paired with. So just go with Gilded. You need it anyway for a bunch of other Dendro characters. Where does this place Kuki? Well, I'd say here. With the flexibility of Dendro, she would obviously be a high 8 here. If you don't use Dendro, she drops down. That's obvious. But Kuki doesn't necessarily have the same flexibility as characters like Fischl and Raiden. This is because Raiden benefits your team with energy recharge and damage. She will benefit your team with energy particles and quite a lot of damage over time. Whereas Kuki Shinobu is a healer, she's competing with other healers and she does drain her own HP. This makes her a bit more risky. Her benefiting your Hyper Blooms is quite nice and her benefiting Aggravate is nice as well. So I'd say that if you wanted to, I could understand a placement with S tier, but I'm going to say for now, she's medium A tier. She's right next to somebody like the yeah, Miko, as they both benefit greatly from Dendro, but without it are kinda eh. Shikanoin Hazo. If you're wondering why I sound different in any portion of this video, it is strictly because this has taken three days. In raw footage, this video is about five hours. Shikanoin Hazo is a character who gets pretty good value out of his constellations, C6 especially, but he does require a lot of on field time, so he makes great use of Sacrificial and or Lost Prayer. The reason why I'm saying Sacrificial is for the elemental mastery he's giving you. As an Nemo character, he's swirling pretty consistently. The Widget is a good option for him, just keep in mind the 10 seconds of downtime you're going to have. Other options like Skyward Atlas are great for his damage because it's benefiting his normal attacks, it's benefiting his elemental damage, and he gets a lot of attack, and he needs a lot of attack. If you don't have any of those, Solar Pearl is a good option if you really need to. Ballad of the Fjords is actually quite good. Even though he's not prioritizing his burst as much, the additional normal and charge attack damage is a benefit to him because that's all he does. Map Amera can work as well. However, with the release of A Thousand Floating Dreams, this does work if you need the elemental mastery. Just keep in mind that the bonus itself is kind of difficult to stack depending on your team you're running. Viridescent Venerer, it is legitimately the only set you need for any Nemo character. If you aren't going for Viridescent, you can go for Glad, Viri, like a Shao build, or just two-piece Glad, two-piece Shimonawas for additional attack. All of his talents hold some value. His skill is going to be his highest damaging priority, with his burst being second, and his normal attacks. Even though his normal attacks do deal decent damage, they are prioritizing Swirling, because Swirling allows him to get stacks on his skill, so you don't need to prioritize his normals as much. As a 4-star DPS, he's already suffering because he's a 4-star. So, what are we placing him on in terms of the tier list? Well, we're going to place him in C tier. His benefits as a Swirler are quite nice, and he is pretty flexible and easy to build, but I will say he doesn't deal as much damage as someone like Yankee Blade because he can't vape. So, it's kind of a downside, but he is still good nonetheless. One of the cutest characters to me, Kale. Now, Kale is, this is my Kale, actually. 73, 142, 165 ER. 
Constellation wise, they benefit her to a degree. I'd say C1 is actually pretty good because she is burst dependent and a lot of compositions you're running her in. Additional dendro damage in any capacity is nice, as is C4, which gives you elemental mastery for everyone but her. So it does help with reactions. Beyond that though, Kali's biggest issue is that she's competing with the likes of Kirara now, Yao Yao, Tignari, and more specifically, Nahida. All characters who can technically do her a job, sometimes better than her, are sometimes with more efficiency. If you're running weapons, Beerus and Hunt looks the best, but outside of that, she's not going to be dealing a lot of damage. So, you can prioritize Elemental Mastery with Stringless or Energy Recharge with Favonius. Both of these are good options. You can go with Fade and Twilight if you need the additional ER and don't have any other alternatives. Sacrificial Bow gives you additional ER and additional skill procs, which can help you out if you need that Dendro application and her burst is not up. Iris Piercer does work, but Kali isn't going to be doing charge attacks too often, at, if at all, so instead I just say only use it for the additional EM it gives you, not for the attack. If you're building her out, you can go with additional crit build or EM focused build. As you see here, Gilded Dreams and Deepwood Memories are her best set. Emblem is only good if you need the energy recharge. I don't recommend getting that, unless you have an abundance of the set. Now, because Kali is a Dendro character, you can either build her with attack or crit. Either one's fine. I personally went, as you can see here, with the traditional crit build. Energy recharge for her burst, you can go with attack percentage or elemental mastery, as you see here. If you were going at, I'd recommend prioritizing the other subsets. If you're going with ER, prioritize attack and crit damage in the subsets, and vice versa. Dendro damage bonus as her main stat for her goblet, or EM, or attack, if you're lacking them, as you see here. Crit rate, crit damage, or elemental mastery, depending on what you need. Kala does not transfer elemental mastery that well. So instead, you're just by fighting her with additional crit build. I don't recommend her normal attacks unless you really like her. I obviously really like her. She has a cute design. I like the side view on the side. It's nice. She's adorable. As such, you can go with her skill for the raw skill damage and then her burst. Beyond that, her normal attacks only if you like them or if you plan on using her as a DPS with something like Thundering Pulse. So where would I place her on the tier list? Well, she's our first Dendro character, aside from the Traveler, but she's not that good of a Dendro character. So a low C tier, possibly even D tier, but I'm placing her higher in the C tier because of how good Dendro is as an element, not how good her kit is. Tignari, I liked his original Eaglin VA better. Now, first and foremost, Tignari is like much like Kali in the same vein. You want crit rate, you want crit damage, you want elemental mastery, and you don't actually need that much energy recharge because of low energy cost. Specifically speaking, his burst cost is only 40. You don't need that much. Ironically enough, Kali's burst cost is higher than his. With that being said, what do you want for him? Well, you can go with Sign of the Blazing Sun or either of the Battle Pass weapons. Both work, honestly. We don't really know if his weapon is coming back. Hunter's Path is a great weapon for him and for characters like Ganyu, and I honestly hope they bring it back, but as of right now, we don't know that. So instead, any of the five star variations, like Lenny's First Great Magic, Aqua Simulacra, or even Amos can work wonderfully for him. If you don't have these, Strainless is nice for the elemental burst damage itself and his elemental mastery. And legitimately speaking, Ibis Piercer for the additional charge attack damage because of the elemental mastery. That's all. He's a charge attack focused character. You want Gilded Dreams, Wanderer's True, or Deepwood Memories. I prioritize Deepwood Memories and Wanderer's True depending on what set you have more of, as you see here. For these main sets, if you're using Hunter's Path, you want elemental mastery on his sands, but if you're using any other weapon, you can go with attack percentage. Then you want Dendro damage bonus, crit rate, or crit damage. That's pretty much it. For constellations, all his cons are stuff you're gonna get. He's a standard banner character, so you don't really need to worry about them. They all benefit him. Just keep in mind, if you are looking at cons, D1 provides him with 15% crit, so maybe keep that in mind when you're building him out. And for his abilities, I'd say all of them are relatively good, but his skill is his lowest priority. His skill just gives him three stacks of his normal attacks, meaning you can instantly charge shot. Normal attack is your top priority, followed by burst, followed by skill. In a tier list, because he's Dentro, he gets a medium C tier ranking. Honestly, I'd say even B tier, strictly because he's very flexible as a Dendro character. I just wish he had his old VA back. Dory, a cute design. I'm loving the tummy here. I like the exposed shoulder area. So overall, I'd say 10 out of 10 design wise. It's when we get to the character that I have issues. Dory is a character I've talked about numerous times. She wants energy recharge. Ultimate Overlord's Mega Magic Great Sword is nice. Sideward Pride is nice. Sacrificial Great Sword is nice. Go with anything with Elemental Mastery or ER. I'd prioritize ER first, EM second. Why is that? Well, Dory is a unit who tries to do multiple roles. She tries to be your Kuku Shinobu. She wants to be your healer who gives you energy. Essentially like a Kuki plus a Raiden or a Mini Fischl. Sounds nice on the surface. However, the problem is Dory has an 80 cost burst. Dory is a battery slash healer who needs another battery. She generates you energy, but she doesn't do that much herself. And so that's why you want to run Sac Frags or Favonius Greatsword. But what's the problem with that? Well, her entire healing and her entire supportive capability is within her burst. 
so you need to get her burst up to do everything else. This is why you'd run Dory with Fischl or Raiden. Now yes, she can she and, and does benefit from something like a Dendro reaction or even Electro Charge or even Overload if you really want to prioritize that. But the problem is Dory is competing for a very populated slot just to use Kuki Shinobu if you want a better Electro Applicator overall. Noblesse Oblige is her best set. I understand she heals based on her HP, so that's why it's an asking the end there. But Noblesse does give your entire team a bit of a damage bonus to the attack. If it doesn't stack, it does not stack. I want to clarify this. A lot of characters want Noblesse. You don't need a lot of Noblesse units built up. So I would instead prioritize Tenacity and Emblem or even Ocean Healed. Don't go Ocean Healed. She doesn't heal that much. And not a lot of you need that set to begin with. All her constellations are decent damage bonuses. I would say her C4 is wonderful just because the additional ER and or HP healing. C6 is nice for an additional Electro Infusion because it's one of the only ways we can legitimately get this. But I honestly don't think her constellations hold that much value. This is why, even though she's a cute character, and I will say she's right there next to Yao Yao and so on, I don't believe that she's a valuable enough character and, so, and certainly does not have the utility of a Diona or a Sayu. As such, we're sliding her right next to Gora. We're finally entering into the section where I don't have to scroll down to find the next character. Oh my god, Candace. We went from one bad four star right up to the next. Candace is basically the exact same thing. First off, she gives you a Hydro Infusion. Sounds good, right? No. Hydro Infusions aren't that valuable because nobody can really take successful advantage of them. Her constellations all benefit her, don't get me wrong, and the additional HP increase is nice. If you use her, give her Favonius Lance, Give her anything with energy recharge. Favonius, you can go with the catch. You can go with Scarlet Sands for the Elemental Mastery. It honestly does not matter. Go with whatever you legitimately need more of. We don't have any HP or any HP related stats. So your only options if you want more HP are Staff of Homa or Black Tassel. Please don't go Black Tassel. Tenacity and Emblem both give her HP and ER. Noblesse, same deal. You already know what to do with that. And Emblem itself is based on if you're building her with a bunch of Elemental or Energy Recharge because it allows her to spam out her burst. Her burst is where you get your infusion from. The burst damage is based on HP, which is why you see tenacity there. The downside is a 60 cost burst on a character who relies on countering, which her skill is, is kind of bad. Now I understand there are niche case scenarios where Candace is useful, but I don't necessarily see niche case scenarios as the worthwhile way or reason to build a character. I see characters who are versatile as being good. It's why characters like Kuga Shinobu or even Faruzan can hold more value than a Candace because yes, Candace can theoretically be better than them in those niche teams. Candace isn't good enough to build because many of you won't ever see a position in which you want to use her. I haven't, despite her having a great design in my opinion. As such, if you're going to invest in her, only do her burst, then her skill, and then her normal attacks can be left at level 1 because she isn't going to be using them unless she's an off-field DPS. But if she is, prioritize either HP for her stats or I would recommend just Hydro Damage because that's all that matters here. HP benefits this damage and the wave damage itself, but she isn't really going to be having her infusion too often or often enough to be qualified as a successful Hydro DPS. Either way, her build will be shown on screen here. She's a very simple character to rank. I would say F tier because she's in the best element in the game with arguably the worst kit out of all of them. Sino. I love his design. We're going to go in depth on constellations, but first and foremost, weapon priority and overall build. My Sino is dealing without his ideal set because I gave part of it to Nahida. So my Sino is at 72, 226, 122 ER, and 61 electro damage bonus with 300 EM. Let's talk weapons because they actually do matter a lot. Scarlet Sand, it's his best in stock. Beyond that, you can go with other weapon options like Staff of Homa or Primordial Jade. If you don't have either one of those, Missive Wind Spear is decent. It was an event exclusive weapon though. The Battle Pass weapons, specifically Deathmatch and Battle of Fjords, are decent too, solely for the crit and the slight elemental mastery bonus you would have. I don't recommend Battle of Fjords or focusing specifically on its passive at least because you aren't going to be having three different elements. I'll tell you why later on. Dragon's Bane is nice for the EM alone, but let's talk his artifacts. Thundering Fury is his best set, followed by Gilded Dreams. Gilded Dreams has, theoretically speaking, more damage, but it's a bit harder to work around and Thundering Fury gives you a little bit more leeway with his skill procs, as you see here. Gilded or Thundering Fury, you can strongbox Thundering Fury, which is why it might be higher for a lot of you to just want to use that. For substats, crit rate, crit damage, elemental mastery, and attack percentage, or ER. If you're using Starlet Sands, elemental mastery for a Sands. If you're using any other weapon, you can go with attack percentage. Scarlet Sands gives him attack based on his elemental mastery, which is why you'd want to prioritize that. Electro damage bonus for a goblet, and then crit rate or crit damage for a circlet, or you can go with elemental mastery if it has really good substats, such as something like this one. Now, for constellations, it kind of depends. C1 is just an attack speed increase. It's nice, but not that good. C2, if you have it, aggravate teams can outdo 
Quicken or, Hy or Quick Bloom teams. So instead, if you have a C2, you can focus on just fighting Sino with a battery and then one Dendro teammate and then a Zhongli. That's it. C4 helps his team with energy recharge, but he's the one who needs the help the most. So please keep in mind it doesn't benefit him that much. And C6 is a large damage increase, and I'd say it makes him have one of the most fun kits in the game. His normal attacks don't need to be leveled at all. His skill, and specifically his burst, has its own skill, and his skill changes form when he's in his burst. So instead, prioritize burst first, then skill, leave normal attacks at level 1. For team synergies, keep in mind he wants to do with somebody like Nahida or DMC. If you don't want to run either of them, or if you have either of them, that's one team's not taken. You can run Fischl next for the battering purposes. If you want his best team, it would be Sino, Nahida, Farina, and then Baiju. Now, despite the fact that I love Sino, he's B tier. He's very difficult to use because he has an 18 second burst duration and that means you can't swap off. He doesn't have the benefit of a character like Razor who swaps off and gets energy based on how much time is left. Sino desperately needs that. I wish that was the C4 instead. Nilu, let's talk about her. It's pretty quick and easy. Just HP. That is legitimately all you care about. HP on Nilu is it 58k is mine. Go to 60k if you can. Duck Hen's Assistant is your best option for a 4 star. 5 star is Kiev Kajna Suit. If you don't have either one of those, go with Elemental Mastery, z Force Moonlight, or Iron Sting. You can also go with Skyward Blade, I don't recommend it though. Just go with z Force. go with the EM or HP weapons, that's legitimately it. Go with 2-piece for Akasha's 2-piece Tenacity. You only want HP, 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 HP. That's all you care about, she's a very simplistic character to build out. Talents, you can leave them out at level 1. For her constellations, you get more value out of going with Nahida's constellations because they benefit her as well, but C2 is her best con for early leveling if you want to stop there. The duration increase is nice and allows her to have much better uptime. I would actually say this is a good con if you use her. Keep in mind, she does want a lot of characters. You want Nilu, then you want Nahida, then you want a Hydro Applicator to help with that, and then you want either Yao Yao or somebody else to help with that. You essentially want two Dendro, two Hydro. This is because her entire kit is based around strictly only having Dendro or Hydro characters. And you need a lot of characters. Nahida herself is the best, I'd say, overall, just because you want that Dendro application on field, but you also want to pair Nahida and Nilo with somebody like Yelan, who can provide you with off-field Hydro application for Nahida's normal attacks. Beyond that, where does she rank on a tier list? Next to Sino. Very restrictive teams. When they pop off, they pop off and work wonderfully because of the AoE. When they don't, she's got awful. So I'd say B tier. The Grass God. I adore her design, she's super cute, but let's talk. A Thousand Floating Dreams is going to be her best option, followed by Kagura's Verity. After that, I honestly don't recommend any of these other weapons. Instead, only go for either Witsith or Sacrificial Fragments, which I would comfortably recommend as Sacrificial Fragments as her second best option for free to plays or her best option in general for F2Ps. Don't prioritize anything else. Elemental Smash is really all she cares about. Artifacts, Deep Wood Memories, just, just go with Deep Wood. I understand Gilded is out and Gilded theoretically sounds good, but don't, don't. Just go with Deep Wood. Deep Wood, Deep Wood, Deep Wood. It's like going with anything else on Raiden. At least with Raiden, I can understand going with Elemental Mastery, but no, Deep Wood. Constellations, C2 is her best. C1 is a quality of life change. C4 is, C6 and C2 are her best cons. C2 providing with Death Shred and everything else. C6 making her a bit of an on-field DPS for a short period of time. Mine is Triple Crown, you don't need to. Just go with her burst, her skill specifically, skill first. First, first, second, and then normal attacks last. Keep in mind, Nahida benefits herself by giving her additional crit, specifically 24% crit. So when you're building out her stats, you want to prioritize as much elemental mastery as possible, then you can go over to substats. Mine's at 66, 154, or if we're advertising and rolling in that 24% crit, we have 90, because it's 66 plus 24. Honestly, Nahida needs the shortest explanation out of everybody. She's an S2 character. That's legitimately it. She's alongside the other two Archons. Layla briefly brought up when we got to the Diona portion. Layla cares about HP. Key of Tautitude is her best weapon. Follow Favonius if you want to or Dark Hand's Assistant. It depends on which one you have the access to. You're going with Tenacity of the Middleleth and or Vorakash's Glow. Go with both. I'd say just to maximize her shield because her shield is all she does. She does not additionally heal you. Her shield and her damage is based on HP. Level up her burst. Second after her skill. For Constellations. All of these are Decent improvements. Layla's biggest issue, of course, is the fact that you legitimately won't be using her unless you want an additional cryo applicator in most teams. As such, if you're looking for substats, HP, I understand you can go with other options like cryo and crit, but only go with crit rate if you're using Favonius. You can build her as a DPS, but I don't recommend it. This is just going over general supporting roles for your teammates. I will be doing a build video for everybody separately much later on. Layla's biggest issue is that she's competing with the crest of the cryo roster, that being Diona as her biggest competitor because Diona just does her job a bit of the same way but with more utility in her healing so keep that in mind.
Where do I rank Layla? Well, I'd honestly say she's a C tier character. She's not as good as, or as flexible as a character like Diona, but she is good nonetheless. To save on to save on time, we'll be ranking Aloy prematurely F tier. That's legitimately it. She already will going in the same position because she's not launched yet. So we only have the rest or a small roster of the Inazuman characters followed by Fontanians. As such, let's continue. Next up, Faruzan, a character I've actually recently built up. Now, Faruzan is a bit of a complicated character because her value inherently depends on if you have either A, Wanderer, or B, Zhao. That's legitimately it. She wants a Warbo and or Sacrificial, which everyone has more energy recharge, or whatever you have more of. She just wants ER. You're going for the Fate and or, no, specifically, I'd say just go with Emblem. As you see here, four piece Emblem, four piece Noblesse, and Acid Millet is not recommended. If you're going with Emblem, Energy Recharge, an Emo Damage Bonus, Crit Rate for Favonius, as you see with these recommended substats. Now, why is Faruzan a bit of a complicated character? It's aside from the value itself it has, Faruzan needs a lot of energy recharge. And yes, it's alleviated by the amount of any more characters you run in your team, but beyond that, her constellations don't help. These two are great for duration increases, but C4 is what you want to hit to just alleviate these energy recharge issues, and C6 is the biggest damage bonus, which is why you only see people leveling up her skill and her burst. Her burst itself gives you a damage bonus. Her skill itself just gives you damage itself, and I don't recommend that. I'd say only level up her skill if you legitimately want to, and while she does transfer up a small amount of her attack, it's not really worth prioritizing. Just do burst, then scale, then normal attack. If you really want to, just get everything to 666. My Farazan doesn't have that much energy, only 200%. The reason why is my Farazan is only run in a team with Xiao and Shenyun. Shenyun generating the most Nemo particles of the entire group. But we'll get into her later on. If you use Nemo characters, I can see Farazan being ranked up here. But I can also see her being ranked down here with Gora. We'll place her right alongside Kujo Sara because she only buffs a small subset of characters, not all the Nemo roster, because you won't be using her with the rest of the Nemo roster. Speaking of which, Wanderer. He was an accidental pull for me, and I do hate his character. But for building him out, he's much like Hazo. You want either his signature weapon, Lost Prayer to the Sacred Winds, or Skyward Atlas. All of these are good. The Winds it sounds nice on paper, but the downtime really hurts its value. You can go with something like Solar Pearl. I can recommend that if you actually need it, I guess, or have it lying around. But beyond that, his constellations hold decent value, C2 being great. C4 assisting with his build and just giving him additional passive bonuses. And then C6 obviously is a C6, it's just his highest damaging con. Now beyond that, Shimano's Remnant is actually a good set for him if you can proc it. I'd actually say I recommend farming this set over something like Viridescent for him or more specifically his specific Desert Pavilion set. Desert Pavilion isn't a set many people want so I don't recommend it. If you're using him with Farina you can go with other options. Desert Pavilion is his best set but Shimanage Remnant is his easiest set to farm for, or we can go with the standard Shao build of Glad, Viridescent, and Venerer. Attack percentage, Anemo damage bonus, and crit rate or crit damage. Talent priority, skill, followed by his burst, followed by his normal attacks. Same and standard rotation for pretty much everybody. He wants to be paired with a crowd character for the additional crit or an attack failing character like Bennett. You can also work with the rare Yun Jin. But if you're building him out, he's basically Shao number two. Pretty simple B tier ranking. Yao Yao, our next character. Let's talk. Extremely hot, wonderful constellations. Mind you, she is the healer. She's either going to be used by you and Genjo teams or not at all. Favonius Lance is her best weapon. Legitimately, just give her Fav or Black Tassel, that is it. Go with Maiden's Beloved, go with Deepwood, go with whatever sets you have that can either give her healing bonus or additional Denjo damage. I went with Maiden's because I have a bunch of it. You can go with Tenacity for the HP bonus. You can go with Deepwood Memories if you have it lying around, specifically with the HP substats or HP main stats. Now, because she's a healer, it's a very standard healing build. HP, HP, healing bonus, or HP. With talent priority, her burst is her heals, her skill is her heals, her normal attacks are unused. As such, she ranks pretty highly. Once again, she's comparable to the rest of the short character roster, who are all adorable and all really valuable. Next on this list is Al Haitham. He's the character who wants Nahida. For weapon options, he's basically Ayato as well. Go with Lighter Foley or Incision. I would just show that build on here. For Constellation value, just C2. All of his cons are good. I'd say C2 or C6. C6 can definitely change his build with an additional 10% crit rate and 70% crit damage. So it's one of the few crit oriented Cs or constellations, but obviously that is a C6 many of you won't have that. Now, I don't recommend prioritizing normal attacks. Instead, prioritize his scale. As you see here, it has its own additional scaling. C, his elemental seal and elemental burst, both are his priorities. I'd say skill first because you're doing that the vast majority of the time. 
bursts second. He's prioritizing and he wants to be paired with a character like Nahida for the additional EM transfer and the help with Dendro Reactions, as well as a Dendro Battery. As a result, if you're going for Setwise, Deep with Memories, or Gilded Dreams. Since we're on to the Dea portion, let's prematurely rank her F tier, alongside I'll hide them. Dendro character, he gets a nice B tier ranking. Actually, I'd say A tier because he does heal extremely high amounts of damage. Now, why is Dea F tier? It's because she is basically the worst standard banner option you can get. Cool design, that's legitimately it though. Dea has energy recharge problems in her kit unless you get constellations. I have C2 Dea. C1 prioritizes HP and makes it more beneficial. C2 is a smaller damage increase. A C6 Dea is the equivalent to a C0 Hu Tao. Doesn't sound too bad, but it's C6 of a standard banner character. You can go with HP or energy recharge. So that's legitimately it. I don't recommend the damaging options unless you have enough energy recharge to match up to what you expect. To match up to what you need specifically. Vorokash's glow, it was made for her. But in a lot of scenarios, just go with Emblem strictly because Emblem alleviates her ER problems. As you see here, Vorokash's and Emblem are relatively close together. Tenacity just has her out with HP. Her skill and burst are our top priority. Her burst has its own scaling, so you don't need to level up a normal attack. Her skill, however, is going to be the amount of damage reduction you get for your teammates. So I'd say skill for supportive utility, then burst. As such, F tier ranking. Ika, honestly, extremely cute design, extremely hot art, a great character, I love him. His voice sucks. Well, we'll keep it short. We'll keep it simple to the point. Let's go. Mika, Favonius Lance. Just go with Favonius Lance. It's anything with energy recharge on it as a, as a pole arm. You want either Emblem of Severed Fate, two-piece, followed by Noblesse, full-piece, Noblesse Oblige, because the four-piece benefits everybody, or two-piece Tenacity for the additional healing options he gives you. Constellation-wise, all of them are good, but he's not a very flexible character. This is strictly because he benefits physical characters, but the only physical characters you actually care about benefiting are him, Fremine, and... Eula. Beyond that, what do you want to prioritize? His burst and then his skill. His skill gives you the damage bonus and attack speed bonus specifically, as you see here, from 18 to 19 percent. But the burst is his healing. The burst is a pretty big focus of his kit. Both of them are equal. I'd say his burst is better if you're using him with Farina or using somebody else with Farina in tandem with him because it allows him to party wide heal, which can help with Farina's fanfare. I know he's not necessarily a complicated character, which is why this is the shortest section of the build. I'd say if you use him with a character like Eula, he can work wonderfully, both as a cryo battery and as additional support. But as a result, I'd say he's kind of meh. So overall, he doesn't reach nearly the same heights as a character like Kujo Sara because of the low tier of his roster. So right behind Sara and right above, a character like Farazan. Actually, let's place him below, strictly because Farazan has maybe more supports or more units you can buff to a better degree. He is still a good character, especially because he does heal. But beyond that, I wouldn't say he's very valuable. Kave, next up. Denjo character, basically the exact same thing as normal. Deep with memories, go to dreams, constellation wise, you're going to be collecting them over time, so none of them inherently change the way he builds out his character. Talent priorities, keep in mind that as a Denjo character he's focusing on reactions, as such the talents themselves don't matter as much, you can legitimately lead them at lower levels unless you like the character themselves. I'd say burst first, then skill, then no more attacks. Since he does benefit damage bonuses on his burst as you can see here, you can go with elemental mastery because he's theoretically at least, proccing the Dendro cores. But you aren't going to find much use out of him because he is technically speaking competing with Nilo for core damage. As such, just laying in a solid C tier. He's only C tier because of Dendro itself, not because of his kit. Next up is Baiju and then we enter into the Fontaine arc. Baiju is just Kokomi, and I mean that unironically. Just build deep with memories, HP, HP, and then healing bonus. The build will be shown on screen here anyway, but keep that in mind. If we're looking at, at weapons outside of his specific one, Prototype Amber or Thrilling Tales of Dragon Slayers. Or you can go with Sacrificial Fragments for the Elemental Mastery, alongside a Thousand Floating Dreams. If you're pairing him with Sinar, you can go with Song of Days Past or just go with Deep with Memories. But your Nahida may be running that if you're running them together. Because he's such a short and simple character and he basically is Kokomi, we'll place them right alongside each other. She's worse because she's not Dendro, but she's better because she, I think, is a bit more flexible in Hydro roster, specifically with Freeze. Next up is in the Kamada, Giara. I adore this character's design. But outside of that, let's talk. She's basically running the exact same build as Nilo. You'd want HP. Xephos Moonlight sounds good because she's proccing elemental reactions of Dendro, but you don't necessarily need it. Doghand's assistant, Kiyo Kachitu, both help her with the shield because she's meant to be a shielder. I'd say, general use case scenario, just one for Bonius. For artifacts, for Akasha's Glow and Tenacity, two-piece, two-piece, as you see here, you can also go with Deep with Memories because that's the Universal Dendro set. Tenacity Millith just helps her out a little bit more for team-wide support. Constellation-wise, additional damage, a co-op additional shield, additional damage, 
and additional elemental damage for your entire party, which is actually beneficial. Her priorities, her skill, then her burst. Her burst is damage bonus itself, but her skill is her shield and that's what you mainly want to use her for. She can work with Nilo oriented teams. But where does she place? Well, it's actually pretty simple. She's a C tier character. You aren't using her too often just because you have much better dendro oriented options and you do have much more flexible shooting options. But if you do need a dendro shooter, she's the best one. Second to Baiju. Actually, I'd say comparable to Baiju because his shield is kind of weak. Next up, the siblings, Lynette. For weapon options, you can go with Zephos Moonlight, Akil Favonia pre C6, Skyward Blade, Favonius, or Sacrificial. All of the weapon options are good, any of them legitimately any of them. The only reason I say Akila Favonia pre-C6 is because her C6 gives her a, an emo infusion. You can go with Golden Truth if you want to prioritize her skill damage, Marshusa Hunter for the two-piece, which benefits her normal and charge attack damage if you're playing her on field. You can go with her Destin, which is the general use case scenario or emblem. All of them work. C6, as I said, gives her an emo infusion. Before that, all of these give her additional damage. Her C4 makes her into a mini Elon, specifically with C5 as it gives her an additional stack. Talent priority, skill, and burst. Both of these are useful. I'd say burst because it's pretty much her off-field damage. Her skill is her on-field damage. It helps her move like Yelan, but she does not generate stamina during it. As an Anemo character, she's better than most, but she's a jack-of-all-trades in an element that has a lot of jack-of-all-trades. C tier. Let's head on over to her brother, both equally cute, Linne. First and foremost, this is my Linne build. 63, 242, no energy recharge, and 46% pyro damage. 40, elemental mastery. First great magic is his best in slot. He's dealing charge attack damage. Aqua Simulacra is great. If you had him and pulled on the Yelan Lenny banner, you were really winning. Outside of that, Amos Bow and pretty much every other weapon that focuses on charge attacks is nice alongside the battle pass options. If you don't have either of them, you can go with Ibis Piercer. But keep in mind the Elemental Master doesn't benefit him at all. Though Fontaine does have a bunch of new craftables like Song of Stillness. I will be showing a build on screen here. Marashusei Hunter is his best set. I honestly just recommend this over legitimately anything else. Wanderer's True benefits him, but doesn't give him the crit, just go with Marashusei Hunter. Crit damage, because he gives so much crit rate in his own kit and in his artifact set. Pyro damage bonus, and then attack percentage. That's it. Constellation wise, all of these are beneficial. C6 providing him the way more damage. C4 is his worst con with the Pyro Res resistance decrease, which can be gained by Viridescent Venerer. And then C2 giving him 60% crit rate or specifically 60% crit damage. I'd say that every constellation is worthwhile to get, and he has a normal attack increase, which focuses on his charge attack other than a skill damage increase. For talent priorities, normal attack first, skill, and then burst. He wants to be paired with other pyro characters. We mentioned this before, a Bennett, a Shangling, and or a Kazuha alongside a Zhongli. In raw damage, Lenny is extremely good, right next to Hu Tao, if not above her. I'd personally say he's the strongest, one of the strongest he's here, five stars but he does require some of the best units. And finally, the last brother, Fermine. First and foremost, Fermi is a complicated character. If you're running pre-C2, Skyward Pride is his best option. Post-C2, you don't need energy recharge as much, so you can go with other options. Serpent Spine being amazing for him. Artifact sets, Pale Flame. J just go with Pale Flame. Blizzard Strayer sounds nice, and you can put him in a cryo-oriented build or a physical-oriented build. Just go with either one, whichever one you have more steps for. Artifacts are your main gripe in this game, so whichever one you have more artifacts for, just go with it's easier than farming a whole new set out. Crit rate and or crit damage, physical damage or crowd damage, and then attack percentage. Constellations, C2 helps with energy recharge. 15% crit rates. This C4 depends on if you're running cryo related reactions like Shatter or Super Contact for physical teams. His attack increase is nice, but keep in mind you still want to build attack percentage on him. And then crit damage increase. C1 and C6 just changes crit. That's it. Prioritize. Leveling all of them relatively equally, I'd say. His skill is additional damage, and it's the vast majority of his kit. But once his skill is out, especially when he's not in his burst form, I'd say his normal attack takes priority. So instead, skill, normal, and then burst. He does want to be paired, in my opinion at least, with Mika for the attack speed increase and the energy recharge. But as a physical character, he's a bit less fluent than a character like Razor. So I would say medium C tier because Razor, in my opinion, is at least a little bit better. So we're going to move Razor up to C tier and from me down to D tier next to Chong Yun. We're in the final stretch. Nuvlets. First off, one of the best, if not the best or second best, or maybe third if you're comparing the on a Hydro character. Hydro is a very populated and very good element. A weapon priority? His best weapon is going to be Tome of the Eternal Flow. It's his best in slot weapon. The HP increase is nice. If you don't have this, Lost Prayer is good for the elemental damage bonus, but once again, he scales off HP, so you don't need to worry about the base attack itself. That's why Skylar Atlas isn't that good. The elemental damage is nice, but beyond that, it's meh. The Wid Sith is also a good option, but you won't be benefiting from the EM, 
the attack percentage won't be benefiting you at all either. Elemental damage is all you're looking for. If you don't have that, you can go with Tail of Pearl. You can subsequently go with Thrilling Tales of Dragon Slayers as well. Marashise Hunter is his best set. Similar to a character like Farina, you will be wondering either Energy Recharge or HP. In his case, it's HP, Hydro Damage Bonus, Crit Rate, Crit Damage. Now, if we're wondering about the damaging you're looking at, his charge attacks fills no more attack priority, followed by his skill and then burst. Now, his skill and burst do give him additional stacks to utilize in his charge attack, but his normal attack is going to be the bread and butter of your entire kit. Focus on that first and foremost, then everything else. Bluntly speaking, Nouvellet is an extremely powerful character at C0, I'd say, right next to Lenny, A tier. High A tier, almost S tier. I wouldn't say S tier because of the flexibility, but A tier either way. Risley, he's a C tier character. I will be showing a build on screen now. But being released during the Fontaine arc does give him some more issues, and I personally don't have him, so I won't speak too heavily on him. Charlotte, preemptively, she's going to be going into C tier. She's a healer, but once again, she lacks the flexibility of Diona. She does scale off attack though, so keep that in mind. Battle of the Fjords gives her the energy recharge she needs. Skyward Atlas and everything else does give her additional attack and small amounts of damage. Sacrificial Fragments can help with energy recharge by giving her additional particles. Favonius Codex is your bread and butter. Additional particles plus ER oriented to kits. Glad and Emblem are good because Glad gives her the attack percentage for additional healing and a small damage increase, but also Emblem gives her the additional energy recharge. Noblesse, once again, gives your, your entire team a party-wide attack bonus, but doesn't stack. Shimonawas is the exact same thing as Glad, so it's basically the exact same build as Glad plus Emblem. If you're going to be building her, energy recharge takes priority over attack percentage. Attack percentage takes priority here because she's not doing much damage, and then healing bonus or crit rate. Crit rate is only useful if you're building her with Favonius Codex. All her constellations just improve her healing. Her attack increase improves her healing capabilities. Energy restoration and a small damage bonus are pretty meh overall. Now she does deal some damage, but almost all of her damage is based on attack percentage, which is nice in theory, but if you're not building out a crit on her, it doesn't matter, and she's meant to be used as a healer and doesn't buff you in any way, shape, or form, so it's kind of meh. Decent character, but not super duper useful for the vast majority of you. This makes her a C tier character. Farina. Now, Farina is a pretty good character. Maybe not the best at C0 because she's not a best in stock for the vast majority of teams, but she is definitely comparable to the likes of a character like Yelon or the Raiden Shogun. Let's talk. Farina is HP scaling. Her best artifact set will be Golden True without a question. Emblem sounds good and does give her energy recharge, but you're basically just using Emblem and Tenacity until you reach four piece Golden True because she's dealing her entire damage off field. Crit rate and or crit damage, whatever you need. HP is comparable to Hydro damage. Just go with whichever has better substats and energy recharge rate or HP, depending on what you need. I'd recommend ER for the vast majority of you. If you don't have her weapon, I obviously went with Taranga Pakafutsu for the design itself. But if you don't have her weapon, you can go with Key of Caution suit, but it does kind of conflict with the HP sands you might be running. So instead, I'd say prioritize either a crit weapon itself, Primordial Jade Wings, Primordial Jade Cutter being the best crit weapon for her, Faster Desire, Fluve, some sort of Seraph Fairy Man, which just gives her skill damage bonus, or any weapon that gives you skill damage itself, like Wolf Fang, which I will be running afterwards once I get this leveled up to 90 for Shinsho. Constellations, C1 is good, C2 is her best. C2 makes her one of, if not the best support for every team because it makes her much more flexible. For Constellations, her skill and then her burst. Her burst is a pretty good thing, don't get me wrong, but her skill allows her party members to do more damage, and if you're dealing damage in a team, you kind of want her damage to be a little bit higher because it does help you spread out it more evenly, to the extent where she's not a DPS loss. Keep in mind, she does want to be paired with good healers. So, some of the better healers. Xian Yun, in a complete set of events, I'm not sure anyone expected that. Chi Chi. Bennett isn't good because Bennett does not provide you with party-wide healing. The same thing applies with characters like Diona. Yao Yao is great for party-wide healing. So too is Mika, and so too is Jean. To the, sh to the shock of absolutely nobody, Farina is going to be placed right up here in S tier. Next up, Navia. Our geo-oriented skill character. Verdict, followed by Serpent Spine, followed by any other 5-star weapon. Constellation-wise, they're all good. I'd say C2 is meh. The problem with her is that Navia herself can get energy recharge from other characters, either using Favonius or another Geo character like Albedo or Zhongli. C2 is a crit rate increase. It only helps out with the damage. If it was crit damage, I'd say it's great, but crit rate means it only alleviates the subs that you're looking for, and her weapon already gives her crit rate. Geo resistance rate is nice, but this is the equivalent to Zhongli, and C6 is a much higher damage increase. Her talents, her skill first, then burst, then normal attacks last. You're running into the new Geo-specific set. For those of you looking to farm it, it is Nighttime Whispering Echoes. 
It's with Song of Days Pass, which may be good for a lot of you Xianyun havers, but it's kind of iffy. Especially if you already have Ocean Huge Clam. Once again, she scales off Attack. So you're looking for Attack Percent Sands, Geo Damage Goblet, and then Crit Rate or Crit Damage Circlets. Now, where does this land Navia? Well, she is our most flexible Geo character outside of Zhongli, and she does deal decent damage, but I will say she's skill dependent, and that puts her in a mid A tier. Next up, Chevrous. Cute character design. Many of you won't be using her. That's just me being blunt, unfortunately. Chevrous is a character who wants Black Tassel or Favonius, depending on which one you have more of. Obviously, if you want to build out DPS, you can just outright go with Staff of Homa. Noblesse Oblige is her best in slot set this is because it's the most flexible set. You can go with Song of Days Pass because she does do a lot of healing. You can go with Tenacity and Vorokachas for more healing, but I'd say just go with Noblesse because it's universally applicable. At C6, she becomes extremely good for the additional damage bonus you provide your team. But before that, I'd say every constellation is a additionally nice damage bonus, but Chevreuse's problem is that she's split scaling and not dual scaling. Her healers are scaling off of her HP, but her damage is scaling off attack. So you only want her to build her skill for the healing. Her burst is solely for damage. Same thing with her normal attack. Don't prioritize that. Chevrous only wants to be paired with other pyro characters or other electro characters. As a result, she wants overload, which we don't really have a need for right now, unless you're Yoimiya main and want to use Yoimiya, followed by Fischl, Chevrous, and that's it. As such, this ranks her in a solid C tier. She might be better over time once we get more characters who want Overload, but as of right now, she's not necessarily a good enough healer to warrant changing your team comp around. Now we're up to date with the roster. Finally, Gaming and Jinyun are last introductions. These are pretty quick because I do and have both of these characters and have built them up pretty well. First and foremost, Gaming. Cute design, Serpent Spine, Best in Slot Weapon, everything else is meh. All of these are good on him, don't get me wrong. I'd say Serpent Spine's biggest issue is the stacking mechanic, especially because he does deal a lot of damage to himself, so you may want to pair him with a healer anyway. But since he can set things on fire, you may end up breaking your shields with him as a result. Instead, if you don't want to use that, you can go with Verdict, Wolf's Gravestone, or any other weapon or anything around your stats. Modern Shusa Hunter is his best in slot. If you have C6, it loses a little bit of value, and you can go with something like Crimson Witch of Flames. If you don't want or have any 5-star weapon, you can go with Rain Slasher. If you're looking into build, you can go with Attack Percentage or Elements Mastery Sands, Power Damage Bonus Goblets, Crit Rate or Crit Damage Circlet. As you see, Marasusa is his best in slot, followed by Crimson Witch, and then 2-piece Crimson, 2-piece Clad for Pyro Damage and Attack Percentage. If you're looking into his talents, Skill first, Burst second, Normal Attack last, or you can go with Skill and Normal Attack equally if you're using him with Qian Yun. I'd say he's an extremely powerful 4-star DPS, but he does want more niche supports like Qian Yun to get maximum value out of. He can work with Bennett, he can work with Farina, so as a result, he moves up slowly in the ranking, but he's not breaching into the A tier category. He can deal A tier damage with the right supports, but that can be said about anybody. So I will say solidly next to Yoimiya. Finally, Xian Yun. First and foremost, she only cares about attack. Attack and energy recharge. Crit rate and crit damage don't mean that much to her. Her best in stat weapon, Crane's Echoing Call, followed by Skyward Atlas for the attack percentage. Outside of that, you can go with Favonius Codex or legitimately anything else that may give you it. I'd honestly say Sacrificial Fragments is good too for the additional plunging and additional particles it can give you. I have Perception actually has a slightly decent user now with the attack percentage it gives you. You can go with 2-piece Shimonawas, 2-piece Emblem. You can go with 4-piece Emblem, 2-piece Shimonawas, 2-piece Gladiators, or Song of Days Past, followed by Echoes or Ocean Hued Clamp. All of these sets are useful. Viridus and Venera is the universal option, but if you aren't going to be swirling stuff, you don't need it. That's only beneficial, in my opinion, if you're wanting to make somebody else plunge or a Ga Ming plunge. For animal teams, it's not useful. Song of Days Pass is a consistent attack buff for your character. Only one of those damages, though. One of those damage orients itself, I mean, meaning that if a character like Hu Tao plunges, only one of those plunges or one of those attacks will get damage. So it won't be equally buffed to all enemies who are hit by just one of those enemies. Constellation wise, C2 is her best con. C6 and beyond are just a damage oriented. C1 helps with ER. C2 helps with her buffing. C3, 4, 5, and 6 make her a bit more of an on field DPS. For talent orientation and specific buffing capabilities, you want her burst for healing, her skill for damage, and her normal attack if she's plunging. Her weapon, Crane's Echo Ring Call, is the best because it provides you with a 28% increase for plunge attacks to other characters. Now then, if we're going to be ranking her, I'd say she's a solid buffer and maybe even A tier because of the party-wide healing making her work wonderfully with a character like Farina. But of course, that's just my opinion. These have all been my opinions. Tell me your thoughts down below. Leave a like if you enjoyed this long video and got to the end, and I'll see you next time.